Right, episode 058, Business Broken to Smoking podcast, and we've got Sean Ely with us. And you pronounce it Ely? I, right? You do, but I answer anything close, Mark, so don't worry. Um, you're with uh, Lazier, uh, and you're an ESOP expert. Exactly, yes. Okay. Expert, is that fair? We are, yes, yes, I, I will take that. Yeah, so today we're talking about ESOPs, we're talking about what they are, how they work, what's good about them, what may not be good about them, who they fit for, um, who's a good candidate, um, how, how to kind of get into one, whether or not it's early or a good time for you as a business owner. So this is aimed at business owners, this is aimed at leadership team members, uh, this is aimed at uh, maybe Advisors, absolutely, advisors, sure. Advisors, yeah, professional, advisors, professionals, professional advisors, attorneys, accountants, wealth managers. Everybody should know. Yeah. Well, thanks, uh, thanks for doing this with us. And um, what are we sipping on here? You brought some Nick, Nicters. I love Nicters. Um, s- side note about Nicters. Uh, there's a fellow named. Oh, what's the name? What's his last name? It's uh, Tom's Foolery. Have you had Tom's I, Foolery? I'm not sure that I have. No. It's. Um, uh, it's in uh, Bainbridge. Okay. And it's a little little distillery. Uh, Tom something or other. I can't remember his last I, name. I've read about it, but I've never. I yes. haven't haven't had it yet. Well, he. Um, I was at a thing with some other business coaches years ago, and he came and brought a bunch of stuff, did a tasting, and uh, he told the story that he has the original Michter's copper still, from when Michter's was like a family owned thing. Okay. Many 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 decades ago. Uh, and uh, I don't know how he found it or how he bought it, but he had uh, a bunch, uh, a handful, two or three Beam brothers come up to Bainbridge from wherever they are. Right. Kentucky, Kentucky I'm guessing. Right, yeah, right. Uh, and set it up for him. And they set it up, this is like years ago, 15 years ago or okay. something. Yeah. And they set it all up. So I uh, drank a bunch and had these stories about it. So, uh, so if you want some bourbon from the original Michter's, uh, Still. Still. Uh, Tom's, Tom's Foolery. Foolery. Yeah. Interesting. That's right. That's right. So, love Michter's. Uh, we're smoking. What do you got there? What are you smoking on? Avo Synchro, Nicaraguan. And what do I got? Same thing? Yes. Avo Synchro? Yes. Yeah. Awesome. Well, so, talk about, first of all, how you... How do you get into ESOPs? How do, how do you become like for what your what your role is? What's that pathway that takes you to? I'm an ESOP guy. That's a great question, and th- I think the, the the quick answer is there's lots of lots of routes that can get you there. And I think maybe I'll talk about our firm a bit and give you some color on on my colleagues. And I think it is um, Lazier Capital Partners based in Columbus. Um, we have very thoughtfully put together, and I can't even take any credit for it, but, but my, my partners and colleagues have really built the firm very intentionally around several uh, disciplines, right? It, it, it is, as you'll come to learn during our discussion here, ESOPs are governed and regulated by the Department of Labor, uh, ERISA, Rules and Regulations, and, and the IRS. What's ERISA? ERISA. Uh, Employee Retirement Income Security Act, okay. right, of 1974, um, which created 401ks and other, you know, sort of retirement plans. Okay. But given those governing entities, uh, we've built a firm with tremendous uh, breadth and depth of knowledge. So different ways to come to it. I have colleagues. I believe we have. I believe we have six attorneys on staff, I think four of those attorneys are tax attorneys coming from uh, the big four and and other um, accounting and and tax backgrounds. I think we have a dozen plus CPAs on staff. Mm. We have a number of CFAs, chartered financial analysts, uh, several ABVs, accredited business valuation folks, a number of former bankers, you know, senior lenders, Folks it's with like private a, equity backgrounds. Seat, buddy. So C, give me that again. CPA. C- CPA. CFA. CFA ABV. Mm-hmm. Uh, tax attorneys. Okay. 
and then senior lenders, you know, bankers, former mm -hmm. bankers, mm -hmm. and then private equity professionals, as well okay. as consultants in the, both the real estate and healthcare space and construction consultants as well. So okay. mm. coming back to your question, how do you get into it? Mm -hmm. My background was investment banking mm -hmm. and private equity. Um, other of my colleagues came through big four accounting, either as CPAs mm -hmm. or, or, or tax mm -hmm. attorneys or tax professionals. So lots of different ways to, to get here. Um, the result for us has been, you know, a fantastic group of professionals that we bring all this depth and breadth of knowledge to bear in the transactions that we do. So it lets us do really great, really thoughtful, really creative transactions for our clients that drive goal fulfillment um, and a great outcome for the client. And, and uh, so there are a bunch of different ways to get here is, yeah. is the, the short answer. So you came out of uh, investment banking and uh, PE right. work? Yep. And is that kind of common, do you think, for, so you got all these other pros that are working at Lazier. Mm -hmm. um, is that kind of common for them? Is that a common place for folks to come from? Is It is. That space? Yes, absolutely. Um, and, you know, senior lending is, is a great ba banking uh, another great avenue. Mm -hmm. um, wherever you're, you're, you know, working with clients in the finance mm -hmm. um, world, right? Yeah. Sure. CPAs sure. as well. You know, we're, what we do, I'm sure we'll talk more about it, but much like you, you know, we guide our clients. We're, we're providing advice and counsel to our clients mm -hmm. about an exit plan. Now our focus here is is ESOPs, mm -hmm. but um, a background in working with clients and, and helping them weigh through the the various options mm -hmm. and choosing paths mm -hmm. can set you up very well to 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 be in this space. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's interesting. Um, how? So t let's talk about. Go ahead and light your. I'll, sure. I'll quit asking you a question. I'll tell you what. I'll talk and you smoke. <laughs> How's that? Um, so ESOP, and I remember uh, first kind of hearing about this, like, what the heck is an ESOP? You know, and right. Um, and it took me a while to get my head around it uh, a little bit. And my goal here today is to have our listeners get their heads right. around what an ESOP is, uh, who it's good for, who it's maybe not good for, uh, and especially we're focusing at. We're focusing on the primarily the individual owner, a family owner, family uh, owned private, yep. privately held. Privately held, right. And what's kind of a good size, I know it's a rough, but what the, an ESOP begins to make sense when? So it's, it's, it's you know, it's from my perspective that it, 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 for us to be involved, probably two to two and a half million of EBITDA is sort of a minimum hurdle. That said, you can do an ESOP for a smaller company. Mm -hmm. The challenge that you face, the smaller that you get, is just the the uh, added cost and complexity of, of both doing the deal and then the ongoing um, expense starts to overwhelm the benefits that you might achieve. So it's it, it's tough, but can smaller companies do ESOPs? Mm. Absolutely. Um, I'll point out that the uh, country's largest ESOP is Publix Supermarkets. You know, based down in, in in Florida in the southeast, they have at, at last count I saw was 200, 240,000 employees. I think so. Wow. Right? You, wow. you think oh, well, ESOPs are just small company phenomena? No, no, not really. Um, uh, locally here in Northeast Ohio, Davy Tree mm -hmm. is is a great example. How big is Davy Tree? I mean, no, I know they're in Kent. They are. I see their trucks and all. Um, that. I can tell you that the last listing that I saw, I think, had them at, I believe it was twelve thousand employees. Wow. Um, so, so they're the largest in Northeast Ohio, second largest, and I know this because Cranes ran in our, uh, uh, one of their lists, Cranes Cleveland Business, uh, last year, last January. Uh, it was, and I should have brought it, but it was Davy Tree was number one. Mm. Uh, number two was uh, Bueller Supermarkets mm. with, interesting. I think they had 1,200 or 1,500 employees, mm -hmm. um, a company in uh, Stowe, ACRT, uh, yeah, I've right. Heard of them. Yep. They're right around here. Right, um, and then 
Number four I'm going to speak to is Garland Industries. Hmm. So Garland's a 100-plus-year-old company based on the sort of near east side of Cleveland. Um, they've been in ESOP since 1985, so a long time ESOP. And they've got 1,000 domestic employees, so those are the 1,000 participants in the uh, ESOP itself. Additionally, they have a, a number of employees and locations across the, the world, really. They, they've, they've been a highly acquisitive company over the years, and they do uh, roofing materials and chemicals and products like that. But uh, for most cases, uh, a company that uh, most folks wouldn't run across. They, they wouldn't know them. Mm-hmm. Highly profitable. They've done very, very well. And in the Cranes list that went out last January, mm-hmm. the um, total assets in the ESOP plan, which are the, the ESOP shares, were $1.2 billion. Wow. $1,186,000, technically. I'm, I'm going to round to $1.2 billion. Mm. Owned by 1,000 domestic employees. Wow. That's so you, some good math. So you do that math, yeah. and, and, and it's, it's a really nice number, right, yeah. for, for those people. Yeah. Um, and, and I think Garland is, is one of those certainly um, uh, great success stories. Obviously, not, not every um, ESOP ends up being that lucrative for the employees. But at the end of the day, it can be a, a fantastic benefit uh, that can change the lives for the employees over time. The, the key to know, though, is it's a retirement benefit. It's not something that shows up in their paycheck that they can borrow against or that they can spend mm-hmm. now, mm-hmm. right? It's a retirement benefit that they realize when, when they retire and, and, mm-hmm. and leave, leave the company. So talk about, well, first of all, what ESOP stands for and what kind of, uh, and, and I want you to explain it to, I'm going to pick like an avatar, let's say, and I'll pick somebody maybe in my space, uh, $10 million, small manufacturing, $10 million in revenue, right. uh, 15%, 20% profit, uh, EBITDA, um, and uh, family-owned, right. multi-generational. Yep. Classic story. A uh, yep. bunch of assets that are, you know, machines and mm-hmm. property, uh, not a bunch, but some right. assets that are machines, property, et cetera, maybe uh, some assets around market share, mm-hmm. uh, that sort of thing. So, first of all, what does ESOP stand for? Okay, ESOP, E-S-O-P, Employee Stock Ownership Plan. So, plan, uh, if you think of 401k plan. Okay. Many, many, most companies mm-hmm. uh, have 401k plans. And ESOP is a very similar, uh, they're governed by the rules of ERISA, Employee Retirement Income Security Act, mm-hmm. passed by Congress in 1974, all subject to the same rules. So, as a result, ESOPs, in large measure, look, act, and feel uh, a lot like or very similar to 401k plans because they're all governed by the same okay. sort of rules. Okay. And so an owner then, like, what's the, what's the uh, what would be attractive? What problems is an ESOP solving for an owner? Let's so put it that way. At a very high level, what I tell folks is, you know, an ESOP is simply another path for succession planning. And I'm here to... I'm not here to tell anyone that it is the only path, it's the best path. It, it really comes down to what the owner's or family's goals and objectives are, right? So it's a way to transition the business, um, but instead of selling perhaps to a private equity fund or a strategic buyer that can have its own pros and cons, you can sell essentially to the employees. And I'm gonna make a distinction here. While you're selling the company, the employees don't invest a dime. Mm. There is no investment whatsoever by the employees. Okay. The owner or family will, will sell the business, their shares, to a trust. The employees are beneficiaries under that trust, mm-hmm. and the sellers will get a portion of their proceeds in cash at closing, and they'll carry a seller note for the balance. And that is paid out of profits of the business over the ensuing years. Typically, we see our clients being paid out in a sort of a four to six year time frame. Yeah, okay. As far now, as the selling party. Right, right. Now, one of the advantages, so I want to make clear, Congress, government broadly, 
supports ESOPs uh, tremendously. Every piece of legislation that's been introduced in Congress over the last 30 plus years has been co-sponsored by a Democrat and Republican. Um, both sides of the aisle have things to like about ESOPs. This is the only thing. Ha, there's I very would... few, right? right? Okay. <laughs> so true. Uh, Mom, apple pie, and, and, and ESOPs, I think. Mm. Um, I'll talk about this, but the right loves the tax breaks that can accrue to the sellers. Mm -hmm. And the left loves the notion of, of, you know, instead of selling to private equity and, and further concentrating wealth, we're spreading it and sharing it with the employee base, yeah, the working common class. Common man, sure. Absolutely. So uh, everybody, and you think about it, who goes into Congress and is going to argue against employee ownership, mm. right? It's, it's like kicking the Easter Bunny or Santa Claus or, mm, right. or anything else, right? right. It's, it's, uh, there's just no reason to. So, mm. um, but as I said, one of, the, one of the big advantages for a seller is there is a tax break available to sellers uh, who are selling to an ESOP. Mm. And I, people can't, they struggle sometimes in believing that this, you know, why does this mm. happen this way? The reality is government can do a lot of things to try to influence our behavior. They can pass laws, rules, regulations, right? Mm. But if they truly want to influence behavior, they use the tax code. Right? If we as a country believe home ownership is important, then we make mortgage interest deductible. If we want to preserve old buildings, what do we do? We provide historic tax credits. Yeah. Urban opportunity zones, I can go on and on and talk about that. So if as a country, as a Congress, we believe um, sharing income producing uh, assets, a business with the employees is a good thing, you can incent owners to do that through the tax code. So mm -hmm. owners have the ability to sell their business and make what's called a 1042 election. And, and you may be familiar with uh, a 1031 exchange in real estate where you can yeah. buy a replacement property and, and defer taxes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, ESOPs have the same, it's just part of the section 1042 of the tax code, allows a selling shareholder to make a 1042 election and defer and then ultimately eliminate capital gains hmm. on the sale of their business. Hmm. So a, a very quick example, if we have a business that's worth $10 million and assume that there's little to no basis, it's, it's been passed down through the generations and there's just not, not much basis at all. Assume that all 10 million is gained. In Ohio today, they're gonna pay approximately two and a half million dollars mm -hmm. in capital gains taxes, 25%. Federal is 20 and you have state at three and change and mm -hmm. potentially some local taxes. Two and a half million dollars. So you, you can sell for 10 million, but once you get fully paid, you're gonna have seven and a half million. Mm -hmm. Or you can do an ESOP, sell for nine million. You can sell for a million dollars less perhaps. Make a 1042 election and then ultimately you'll receive the full $9 million because you get to avoid that at $2.5 million in taxes. Now, if you make the 1042 election, there, there are additional hoops to jump through. I've, I've discovered that the government's just not gonna make a tax break easy, but you know, we work with our clients and, and get them, um, walk them through that, that process. But at the end of the day, saving 25% is, is compelling. Yeah. Uh, I just closed a transaction in Oregon and uh, Oregon State capital gains tax is 9.9%. On the state. So in addition to 20% federal, they're paying Many, 30%. Min Minnesota is pretty stiff too. Uh, yep, Massachusetts is crazy. I can tell you this, if you have the, the, the honor and privilege of living and owning a business in the Republic of California, <laughs> you're gonna pay 33.3%. Ooh, wow. In plus total. The, no, no, sorry, in total, 20%. Total, okay, 20% of the... 13.3% okay. wow. California. Jeez. Okay. So... Is that, the, is that the worst state? It is. To sell yeah. a business? Yeah, I think Massachusetts is second. And that's capital gains? Capital gains, absolutely, right. So that is paid only on the portion of, of gain, right? You mm -hmm. understand the concept mm -hmm. of gain, whatever you paid for it, less what you sold it for. Hmm. Uh, but most companies that we deal with have very little basis. You know, they're, they're, their family-owned businesses have been around forever. They were started... Yeah, uh, they they pulled out distributions and dividends, yeah. and, and so there's just not. And you're saying basis, you're using the accounting term. Right? I am, yes. Okay, explain yes. that. Well, basis simply represents the original investment 
made. If okay. you buy a stock at $100 and you sell it for $150, mm -hmm. your basis is $100, and, and your gain, therefore, would be $50. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. It took me a while to get Yeah, sorry. It. As <laughs> no. a layman. No, well, I, 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 yeah, I understand. Yeah. I, and there's there's a lot of, you know, CPA jokes, attorney jokes, uh, engineer right. jokes, right? There's, <laughs> there's all kind of ways that we can, yes. we can talk about yes. that. Um, all right, so 1042 election. Uh, so benefit, and this is, you know, one of the major points I want to cover is uh, the basic clear benefit. So there's a benefit to the, to your folks. And as I've explained this very poorly <laughs> to, right. to right. clients of mine, and they'll ask me about it. Uh, first of all, I'm like, talk to Sean Ely. Right. But second of all, um, they, if they want to be good to their staff, a lot sure. of times they're building this business and they're right. saying, you know, it sure would be cool if these folks could have some piece of it and they don't know how to do that. Right. And there's profit sharing or should I make them partners or it just gets really, there's, there, there's a number of options. Right. Um, I don't know that any of them are simple, but there are True. pros and cons, Right. you know? Right. So let's talk through the pros and cons of a, uh, well, first, let's talk through the options. So ESOP right. is one, which is employee stock option. Ownership. Ownership, plan. stock ownership plan. Yep. All right. Another option would be sell to PE. Right. Um, you can sell to strategic. but We, yeah. we call them strategic, but a, okay. a competitor yeah. okay. in your industry. What about, so sell, you know, and then you could sell to key employees. Management buyout, right? Yeah. Yep. Um, what other options? Uh, and then really just, you know, the random guy down the street. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, just put it on just, the market. Just a third-party buyer, mm -hmm. right? That's not a professional PE yeah. fund or uh, strategic. And all those other ways other than the ESOP have a more uh, front-loaded tax consequence, it sounds like. Uh, they do. I, uh, unless you sell to an ESOP and make the 1042 election, mm -hmm. you will pay capital gains taxes. I, no death and taxes, right? There's mm -hmm. there's no way around those. Um, so yeah, you don't have the ability to avoid uh, de defer and then ultimately eliminate capital gains taxes. This is a good cigar, by the way. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's Avo. It's what is it? Uh, Avo Synchro, and then it's their Nicaraguan. Avo Synchro. It's great. Yeah. yeah. Um, I I think what what we see is the vast majority of our clients end up being, you know, multi-generational family businesses where, you know, grandma and grandpa founded the business, Gen 2 ran it, and now, you know, mom and dad are, are running it. They're the third generation business, third generation owners rather. It's, the business has provided a wonderful life for the family. You know, they, they have their home in Florida. They've got a cabin in Canada. They travel, they, they, they live in a great house here in Northeast Ohio, wherever our home might be. Um, it's put their three kids through college, mm -hmm. but now one kid is an attorney in New York. One's a doctor in Chicago, a uh, daughter may be a, an actress in LA. None of them want to come back and run the family business. Mm -hmm. Mom and dad are, are getting to the age where they're starting to contemplate mm -hmm. retirement and exit and succession planning. And they, they, they look at the business and it's grown to become more than just a profit generating enterprise. It's part of the fabric of their lives. It's part of who they are, mm -hmm. part of their identity, part of their legacy. In many cases, it's their name over the door. And they've gotten to a point where they don't want to just sell it to some random third party. It could be the kindest, gentlest, mm -hmm. most wonderful third party in the world, but notion of handing it off to somebody and, 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 and letting that take its own path with whatever the new buyer is going to do is, is hard for them. I've heard many of my clients say, uh, and, and I'll, I'll use a specific quote, uh, a gentleman said to me, Sean, my dad and my, my uncle started this business, 1947. You know, I've got 250 employees out on the, on the floor. He said, easily half of them or their parents mm. work for my dad and my uncle. I've been to more 
weddings, high school graduations, funerals. I've been in their homes. Yeah. You know, these people, I've, I've paid them well and I've shared when I, what I can and, and could. Mm-hmm. Um, but these people mean something to me. They've, they've, they've helped my family mm-hmm. get to this point where we're going to sell the business for 30 or $40 million, whatever the number might be. Um, I'd love to reward them. Mm-hmm. You know, now, one of the overarching sentiments that I always hear, though, is, is, is and rightfully so, these owners say, I want a fair price for my business. Right? I, that said, I don't need every last dime, but, I, but I, don't, I don't want to take a big discount. We've worked hard. We've invested sweat and equity and took the risk three generations ago to launch this. Um, I want a fair price, but if, if I can feel comfortable that I got that fair price, then I want to I want to make sure I do all these other things: reward my employees, preserve the history, the culture, the legacy of the company. I continue on the same path. Let it remain independent. Keep the jobs here in this community, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, yeah, sure. And the great thing about that, Mark, I can do that with my eyes closed because by law, ESOPs are permitted to pay fair market value. It's written right in in the code. What does that mean? Fair market value sort of arm's length negotiation, everybody having full information, et cetera. Uh, it's not a scientifically derived point. So it's something that, that you know, you and I would negotiate mm-hmm. to arrive at a fair market value. What an ESOP can't do is pay more than what's termed adequate consideration. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, so at a premium of some sort. Exactly. What it can't do is pay the price that a strategic buyer mm-hmm. might be able to pay. So uh, again, a strategic buyer would be somebody in the industry or adjacent industry that has the ability to typically cut a lot of costs. All your internal staff, yeah. you know, HR, accounting, et cetera, because they have yeah, their own. They, that, right. they don't need it, right? Yep. So it's redundant. So they cut all those costs, mm-hmm. profits immediately go up mm-hmm. just by doing that. They don't have to grow yeah. revenues. Yeah. So we can't pay a premium in the, in the ESOP world, but we can pay a fair market value. Mm-hmm. And so I will tell you, the vast majority of my clients are folks that say, I, I, I just want to feel good that I'm not being a chump, that I'm not taking... Mm-hmm you know, less than, than I should. And our job representing our clients is to advocate for what, you know, we call it a, a full and fair value, right? Get them exactly as much as we can within the bounds of, mm-hmm. of fairness. Mm-hmm. And our clients love it. I, interestingly enough, I've actually had two clients who have taken less than I was able to negotiate for them. I think one why case, they why they do that? Here's what they said in the one case that sticks out in my mind. I think we had negotiated a, to a twenty nine million dollar value for the business, and the seller said, "Yeah, you, you've done a wonderful job. I appreciate it, but all I want is twenty five. His number in his head was twenty five million, mm-hmm. and once once he got that, he didn't need more. And and he recognized it. And and I think many folks do, whether the number is twenty five or thirty or thirty five. Maybe a strategic would pay you $35 million. My client said to me, I'm not going to spend the 25 yeah. that I'm taking. Yeah, once you hit a certain level, it's like, what's it matter? Right. I mean, it, it matters, it, but... It, 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 look, we're all competitive. Uh, you, you don't become a business owner by, by, by not having that competitive drive and fire. Mm. So it's all, more is always good, generally. Mm. Uh, there's a competitive nature. I want to get. Uh, I want to be paid fairly. I, I, I want more. But it, if they look in the mirror and they, they really sort of check what's important to them, the reality is 25 million is more than they'll ever need. And it just becomes an, uh, a question of how much they leave to children, grandchildren, or charity. Hmm. Yeah, that's great. If, uh, so I'm kind of making a list of maybe key, uh, that's what I'm looking for, key triggers for sure. yep. when an ESOP would make sense. So um, no, it, it's, you know, no clear, path to succession. There are many great family businesses that have passed down generation to generation. Mm-hmm. Um, typically, the, the challenge that they have is most of those intergenerational transfers don't really drive liquidity or dollars to the sellers. Mm-hmm. You'll, you'll get some, but you're, you're typically, uh, and again, you know, yeah. people can argue, but I think typically you're not getting a full market value. Yeah, it's kind of discounted. You're providing a discount, and, and it's coming sure. m- over time, mm-hmm. right? In terms of how, how that 
previous generation has paid. But what happens when you get to whatever gen it is, three, four, and the next generation doesn't want to step in? Yeah. Sometimes it's, it's the success of the business, right? Has yeah. Yeah. The kids aren't interested in coming in. And, sure. and many say, I, I don't want to work hard like mom and yeah. dad did. I, I, yeah. I watch them work right. really, really hard. And, and I'm, you know, I'm kind of comfortable. Yeah. I don't want to do that. Yeah. yeah. And a lot of times the business, not a lot of times, all the time, every time, I think, maybe it's too big of a statement, but the business outgrows the ability of the owners to, to manage it. Yes. The man, you know, everybody that owns a business has some management ceiling. Yes. And if the business is healthy and robust, which by nature is what we're trying to do is have right. a healthy, robust business. Right. And so at some point, um, they hit a ceiling, you know, and the business outgrows their ability. And, and, and many times what we see are lifestyle businesses, right? Where it gets to a certain point, it produces a certain level of income and cash flow to that owner every year. Yeah. And they're happy. It provides them a wonderful life. They vacation for you know, 15 weeks a year, mm -hmm. everything's paid for by the company, you know, the country club and all the cars and their travels, all business travel. Mm -hmm. And they, so they don't really reinvest in the business or they're not, mm -hmm. you know, they're not pushing, yeah. taking yeah. risk because it's comfortable. I can tell you, I had a, a client um, that it was founder owned and, and he, he was an old school, right? Uh, sort of hard driving guy had his way of, of running the business. Ultimately, he, 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 he sold uh, to an ESOP. I, I advised on the transaction and he stepped away. He was, he was done, stepped away from the business. He had um, two key um, managers in, in, in the business uh, that, that had been really running it in, in um, the last couple of years. When he stepped out and let them run it, uh, they doubled profits. In a year. Wow. In a year. Now, that, uh, again, I don't want to say that happens yeah. all the time, but they were chomping at the bit to be able to yeah. implement change. Sure. And the owner just didn't want, well, he had his way yeah. to do it. Yeah, yeah, sure. And, and it worked. I mean, it was, a, it was a nice company when he sold it. It was twice as nice a year later. Mm -hmm. and, and they continue to grow. It's, it's been a, a very eye-opening experience for everybody yeah. there. That's really good. I, and I love to hear those stories, of course. I, I only tell the good stories. I only tell the ones that, that come out like that. Sure. Okay. <laughs> Can you tell some bad stories about it? Yeah, about you know what I'll ESOP? say? Um, ESOPs are only a form of ownership. So, so both the good and the bad can't necessarily be attributed specifically mm -hmm. to being an ESOP. But I, I think um, on the good side, study after study will, will show you academic peer-reviewed studies will show that ESOP companies outperform their peers across any metric. Anything that you want to measure, sales growth, margin, profitability, productivity, employee engagement, customer satisfaction, anything you want to measure on average, ESOP companies are going to outperform. Mm. Now, are there high-performing non-ESOP companies? Absolutely. Absolutely, but on average, you, you, you know, you, you chart them on a bell curve, ESOP companies are gonna outperform. And you know, the, the quick answer there is, is why is that? It's because everybody has skin in the game and they're all rowing in the same direction, mm -hmm. generally speaking, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, there's there, kind of a unified, there's a unified it, reason to be We doing have that. economic self-interest in, mm -hmm. in, in doing this. Yeah. Um, hmm. There's a, a, a quote that's, that's often used, uh, nobody washes a rental car. <laughs> right, yeah. Okay? Yeah, that's interesting. You, know, you own it, you, yeah. you, know, yeah, you, yeah, you take you, care you, of it. You take care of it, sure. you clean it. And, and that's what you see in mm -hmm. ESOPs. Um, so they, they tend to do well. Mm. Um, they tend to be, uh, once it becomes an ESOP, a little more open book mm -hmm. management style. And, and that means different things to different people. Mm -hmm. um, doesn't have to be. Uh, the challenges that you face Look, if you are a buggy whip company and you do an ESOP mm -hmm. and then Mr. Ford comes along with this horseless carriage thing and you don't pivot, an ESOP's not going to, mm -hmm. you know, prevent your demise. I mean, you're still a business and you still yeah, have yeah. to react and, and yeah. coaching can be important, yeah. right? right? And guidance. Sure. Um, but it tends to allow more collaboration and, and yeah. um, 
being open to different ideas. Yeah. But yeah, if, if you know, it's not, it's not insurance against failure, but again, these peer reviewed academic studies have, have tracked and shown ESOP companies half as likely to go out of business. Hmm. Yeah. As, as opposed to the others, which, yeah, just which non, are, non ESOP companies. Right. Yeah. And, and what's and, that, uh, what's that rate? Well, well, it's just half as, as much. I, I don't know. Oh, oh, half don't know what, as much as the, half okay. as much. Uh, yeah. I see. That's a, I think a Rutgers, uh, study, yeah. uh, yeah, yeah. showed that, but, and we haven't touched on this, but one of the reasons for that is, well, we did touch on this part, right? The, the employees all banding together and, mm -hmm. and there were stories coming out of the, the 08 recession where ESOP companies, um, employees aren't dumb, right? They realize when things are slow and orders aren't coming in and, and whatnot, and they knew the company needed to do layoffs. It, it was just obvious, we can't carry all these people. Um, story of, 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 of the employees banding together and saying, you know what? We're all gonna go to 30 hours mm. instead of 40, mm -hmm. and that way nobody gets, you know, we all yeah. feel some collective pain. Yeah. Soften the blow. But, but really kind of special, mm -hmm. right? Uh, the other thing that we haven't touched on yet is the notion that 100% S Corp ESOP does not pay federal or state income taxes. Huh. Right? Think about what that means. Does not pay federal or state income taxes. So today, if you have an S Corp, it, certainly in Ohio, um, you're typically making tax distributions at about 40 or 45% of your, your pre tax earnings. That money goes to the shareholders on a pro rata basis, and they s turn around and simply pay it to the government for taxes to cover their tax liability. So I'm a round numbers guy. If you've got a million dollars of pre-tax earnings, you'll distribute 450,000 to the shareholders. Mm -hmm. They pay their taxes quarterly or otherwise, and the company's left with 550,000 of post-tax earnings. If that company is an ESOP, the million dollars pre-tax is a million dollars post-tax. Mm -hmm incredibly powerful, right? You put two equal companies, revenues, gross profit, right down to, to pre-tax profit. Mm -hmm. One's an ESOP and, and the other isn't. Which would you bet on to, to flourish or yeah. to survive a downturn better? Yeah. Does that create a strategic um, advantage for an ESOP in the marketplace? You know, as, as if they don't have to, you know, as they're stacking up a war chest, let's say, right, uh, and and you're paying capital gains or, or you know Fed Fed and state income tax on that war chest, uh, and but you're stacking it up to do a strategic purchase, get into another marketplace, uh, yes. get into another line, another another offering or something like that. At, it's at, painful, right. right? So, but as an ESOP, you're saying there's a, an advantage there, at, at, without a doubt. Now. We have to be clear, uh, typically e ESOPs are, are, are leveraged, whether they're third-party leverage or not. So a typical structure in, in, in an ESOP transaction, we, we, we will typically tell clients that you should expect between 20 and 40% of the value of the business in cash at closing. Okay. Assuming no debt on the business, right? Mm -hmm. so, so in my $10 million business example, probably $3 million plus or minus of mm -hmm of cash at closing goes to you. The seller at that point will carry a $7 million seller note. Okay. Three in cash plus seven yields your $10 million value, right? Mm -hmm. So at that point, you're 100% levered. Mm -hmm. Now that causes some banks to freak out, right? Mm -hmm. they, they look at us, wait a minute, I can't lend to a company that's 100% leveraged, there's no equity here. Mm -hmm. Well, the reality is that $7 million is held by the seller, mm -hmm. right? And the seller doesn't see a dime of that principal until the bank is paid or the bank permits them to be to be paid right so they're junior they're subordinated um, they're earning typically 12 percent on that seller note which is fairly attractive but it's subordinated right mm -hmm. and so um, you, you're a levered company coming out of the transaction and what you do with this excess cash flow that we talk about where you're not paying taxes you do three things you hammer the debt down very very quickly because that's really, Mark, as, as, as you know, debt is the, the biggest risk to any business. Yeah, right. Right? So you wanna hammer that debt down, you uh, fund growth initiatives at the company, and you put a few dollars away every year to build uh, a pool of capital to ultimately repurchase those shares mm -hmm. when employees retire, right? 
So you can be acquisitive. It's tough to be acquisitive in the first two or three years because you've really got to pay that debt down. But you're doing it with uh, uh, tax-free cash flows. Yeah. You know, that I talked about. So hmm. most companies see a, a, a very aggressive pay down of, of that debt. And then in a couple of years, they can start to become acquirers if, if that's part of their growth plan. Mm -hmm. So when, and I want to ask you about the particulars uh, more from an employee's perspective and from an owner's perspective, perspective as you're going, and I want you to kind of walk through the process, maybe how long it takes from an employee's perspective. What does it look like? What's that? Uh, what are things they can look forward to? What are things they ought to know about? Right. Uh, and this will help the listener to kind of go, okay, this is this, this is how is my how folks works. are going right. to see this or how it's going to benefit them or what burden they're going to carry. Right. How does it change their right. worldview? How does it change maybe their roles or how they hire and fire, how they manage? And then from the owner's side, I want to walk through, okay, what's that look like as they go along and paint a picture of three years in, five years in, generally right. speaking. Uh, but so far, as far as if you're a candidate for mm -hmm. an ESOP, right. we got no uh, one is uh, no clear path to succession. Mm -hmm. So it's not a really strong, hey, I'm giving this to my kids or something mm -hmm. like that. Second, uh, two million plus in EBITDA. Right. Third would be uh, if a fair market value is reasonable. Right. Not a strategic right. uh, sell to a competitor for more than fair ma market value. Uh, Next would be if you really care about your staff and right. you care and you want to give them something cool, something meaningful. Absolutely. And then kind of lastly was um, if there's a unity of culture and you want to maybe invest in that unity that's already that's already there. Preserve it certainly for, yeah. for future yeah. generations. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, preserve. So is that fair? Is there, are there other points or are there other good? Uh, no, I, I, you know, as I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think about it, I, I think you've done a great job of, of summarizing mm. um, a, a lot of the key ideas. You know, I, I try to spend a lot of time with prospects talking to them about what's important to them, what their goals are. Mm -hmm. So uh, the trade-off, let, let's talk about some of that, right? So a trade-off with an ESOP is generally speaking, you're going to get less than you might in a third party sale mm -hmm. because at closing yeah not in total yeah just talking about sticker price at closing yeah um no uh, so there's here, here's one of the things so let's talk about sticker price and we'll come back mm -hmm. to cash or closing so many people i the example i used you can sell to a third party mm -hmm. and maybe they're going to pay you 10 million mm -hmm. but in esop maybe they're going to come in and pay they can only pay 9 million mm -hmm. well you're you're taking less right that's 10 percent less yeah but that's not after tax. Yeah, right, right, right. Do you care about the headline value or do you care about what you put in your pocket and what yeah. you can truly spend? Yeah, is it fair to call that like realized or? Net after tax yeah. proceeds, mm -hmm. a lot of different ways to measure mm -hmm. it. Okay. Um, but yeah, and, and I think the reality is if you do the math, um, if you sell to an ESOP at a six times EBITDA multiple, you have to sell to a third party at an eight times multiple to get the same net after tax mm. okay. proceeds, mm. right? And so, so it's kind of a no brainer. I, well, I mean, it's it, it, but, but it's here, assuming here, you're checking those other boxes. Absolutely, right? but 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 here here's one of the trade offs. So I I, I talk to folks and yeah. I, I say, how did you come to own the business? Sometimes it's obvious. It's 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 a long time right family owned business, but if, if the candidate says to me, you know, I bought this business 20 years ago. I, I, uh, I mortgaged my house, I emptied my 401k, I, I, I put all my money in here. I, I've paid myself competitively along the way, but I've really never had a liquidity event. Mm -hmm. And I'm done, and I wanna go to the beach, and, and I'm, right? Mm -hmm. Then that screams to me, do an auction to private equity, get as much cash as possible, and, and you're done, right? Mm -hmm. and, and by the way, for, for the listeners, sometimes there's, there's a notion that you sell to private equity, if they tell you they're gonna pay you $10 million, that they, they write you a check for $10 million. Right. It ain't like that. It ain't like that, <laughs> exactly. You're gonna get 70%, you're gonna get 80% perhaps, mm -hmm. but there's gonna be some level of rollover, some sort of a earn out portion mm -hmm. of that number. So you, 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 you mm -hmm. don't get, typically, you don't get all your money in yeah. cash, but yeah. you're gonna get more 
Now you're gonna have to pay taxes, of course, mm -hmm. than you would get in an ESOP at closing, mm -hmm. right? So, so the other uh, question I'll ask is, um, if your goal is to, you know, you're gonna sell your business and you wanna buy, you know, I'm, I'm being facetious, but you wanna buy an NBA franchise or an island in the Caribbean, ESOP's probably not the way to go because again, you're not gonna get as much cash at closing as you would from another buyer. Yeah. Right. So you have to understand that. And then, and then finally, uh, and, and perhaps this is, is a risk that I, I should have flagged earlier. You have to believe in the future prospects of your business. Mm -hmm. Okay. If there is something, and, and I say that because you need the business to survive at minimum long enough to pay that seller note back. Mm. Right. Yeah, because you're putting the business in the hands of your staff. Of your, of uh, your... not necessarily, and, and okay. I'll, I'll touch on that. But um, you do need the business to survive to pay your, your. It's the future profits of the business that will pay that seller note back to you, right? And so, what I say to my clients or prospects is, if you believe there is a specific identifiable threat to your business, whether it be the internet, Amazon. Uh, uh, China, tariffs, mm -hmm. whatever it might be. If there's something specific that keeps you up at night that that makes you very nervous, by all means, do not do an ESOP. Mm. I'll happily sell you. And by the way, we do third-party sales mm -hmm. as well. We just predominantly do ESOPs, but mm -hmm. the firm was founded 25 years ago doing the traditional mm -hmm. third-party sales. So we're ha we'll happily do that for a client. Mm -hmm. um, and if, if, if there is this specific identifiable threat, Let's do a third-party sale, get as much cash at closing, and you roll the dice on the rest and, and, and see what happens, right? Mm. But let, let's circle back to your, your, your question. And before you do that, I'm all over. Um, many, most of my clients, as I think you, you probably appreciate, are, are in many cases multi-generational business. They've been around for 100 years. They survived world wars, in some cases, Great Depressions, yeah, the Great yeah. Recession, stagflation, yeah. inflation. Yeah, yeah. And COVID, right? And and here we are in 2024, and and they're like, you know what? We feel pretty good. We have a, a, a neat niche here, mm -hmm. and and we're okay. Mm -hmm. Those Solid are great business. stops. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But your question of their uh, owners handing it off mm -hmm. to employees, generally, so it runs the full gamut. You can sell to an ESOP, and you can walk away at closing if you want, or you can stay and die with your boots on. Mm -hmm. or the vast majority marker in the middle, there are folks that say, I'm not ready to walk away today, but I wanna know that I've got an off ramp, I've got a map now, and I don't have to take the next exit or the one after that, but maybe that third or fourth exit in a couple of years, I'm gonna peel off. Many of my clients are folks that they wanna step back from 60 hours a week to 40, Mm -hmm. you know, to 30, they, they, they want to take more time mm -hmm. to travel, to, to be in Florida for the winter. And you can do that because at the end of the day, you don't have a new third party partner. You're not reporting to somebody new. It's you and the management team continuing to run the business. So mm -hmm. what many of my clients do, uh, perhaps they don't have a strong succession plan from a, from a management standpoint. Uh, they can use that period of time that they're still there sort of running the business to coach up mm. their team. Perhaps they could hire mm -hmm. a great I know one. coach That's like, right. like, like you, <laughs> yeah. right? I'll and, do that. and come in and, and coach those people up. Yeah. Sometimes it involves recruiting somebody from yeah. outside. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But one of the things to keep in mind is, is, is most of the seller notes that we see in our clients are, are outstanding for four, four to six years. So this may shock you, but, but many of these business owners are control freaks. Right, right. Shock, shocking, yeah. right? Yeah. And that's okay because sure. now they've got this big seller note, they want to have their hands on the, they want to be driving the bus yeah. to make sure that note gets repaid. Yeah. They got $7 million on that seller note waiting, waiting to get paid. They want to make sure they're still in control. Absolutely, you do that. And they decide what role they play and how long they stick around. Okay. But what I've found is and, and you know, in business, it, it's half psychology, right? It, it's not strategy and, and any other stuff. It's 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 motivating employees, your your own internal issues as an right. owner. Um, I found many of my folks, once they they finally put a stake in the ground, at a price, whatever it is, they've always been chasing value. I'll work one more year. I'm, I'm going to be worth right. more next year, right? right? Okay. They finally put a stake in the ground. 
good, bad, or indifferent. It's it's, yeah. and I would argue it's a good price. It's yeah. a fair market price. It is what it is. Yeah. And there's a lot of pressure that just sort of comes off those shoulders, and they get back to doing what's fun. Right. They're coaching yeah. their people. A lot of a lot of business owners, if they've launched the business, they were a technical guy. They they want to get they want to spend some time and get back out on the plant floor and not not run the business because that's boring. They want to get back out on the plant floor. Others are more sales driven. They want to get out and talk to customers, and they and they start to hand off responsibilities, and people start to step up, and 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 take over. And over four to six years in that time period where that seller note is getting paid off in chunks. People are getting more responsibility. The, the the owner feels great. He sees his people blossoming. Mm -hmm. You know, and occasionally you have to pull somebody in from outside. Mm -hmm. But it's uh, it, it's really whatever the owner wants. And I can tell you, I don't like to speak ill of my brethren in the private equity community. I was I was one of them for a I long do. time. <laughs> I get kidding. it. I get kidding. it. I get it. It's it can be a love hate kind of thing, it, but it, there's there's value there. there. Absolutely, there there are some wonderful private equity firms out there that do good work, mm -hmm. right for their clients. And there are some business out there that need some level of discipline and 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 focus, right? But oh, I found we, we get any given year, maybe twenty percent or more of our of our clients come to us out of busted auctions. Mm. where they had hired another investment banker, they were lured in by the uh, siren song of private equity is the best thing in the world and they're gonna mm. pay me all sorts of crazy prices. And, and, and they, they, they get these blinders on, they, they get excited about yeah, big yeah. dollars. They go into the process and the process itself is, is fun because if I'm running a private equity process, I'll bring three to five finalists in to meet management and do a management presentation and they all Tell the owner wonderful things. You, you, you've done, a, the flow in your factory is phenomenal. The way you, you, you've built your management team, best I've ever seen. And it feels good to, to, to get yeah, those. Finally, they got that validation. Validation, right. accolades, right? Somebody sees me. Yes, yeah. I knew it. <laughs> but eventually you select one buyer. Hmm. And, and it doesn't happen all the time, but it happens enough that there are stories out there of, you sign the LOI, letter of intent, and then the gloves come off. Hmm. Right. And and the owner gets whipsawed. Suddenly due diligence starts. And now, again, depend, it, not all the time, but there's some firms that, that their whole goal is to find every dime that allows them to reduce EBITDA and pay less. Yeah. And sometimes it's the first retrade that happens. Sometimes it's the second. Certainly by the third, the owner in many cases says, I'm yeah. done. Yeah, yeah. This is this is bullshit. It's it's it's, uh, it's grueling. It, right? it, it can be. It, I, again, I don't want to paint it as all that mm -hmm. way, but they walk away because mm -hmm. it's not what they want. I don't trust you. I don't want my employees to have to deal with you, and they walk away. Mm -hmm. Now they haven't addressed their succession plan, or their yeah. liquidity needs, yeah. and they're introduced to us, hmm. and it's awesome. They don't they don't believe anything we say because they've been sure. once bitten, right? Right. Eventually, we're engaged. We get them through the process, and, and the funny thing is. I'll call the client periodically for things and they'll answer the phone. What? <laughs> Worried, like the other shoe's gonna drop. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is when he tells me the price changes. Mm -hmm. No, I'm just trying to confirm our, our meeting next Tuesday, right? You, we all good? Mm -hmm. Okay. We get mm -hmm. to closing. We close at or above the number that we told him. Mm -hmm. There's more cash at closing than we told him. Mm -hmm. And he's just incredulous. Yeah. Because yeah, yeah. He, he had just lived through that other process, that, that, was like nine rounds with Mike Tyson, mm -hmm. right? And ours is a much more professional, cordial process because an ESOP buyer, the, the trustee, which we, we should probably talk about, is not a true economic buyer, mm -hmm. okay? A trustee is not economically motivated to drive the price down they are sincerely motivated to not pay more than fair market value, but there's no true economic incentive to drive the price down. They just wanna know that it's fair. Now, in every other sort of scenario, and, and even in our personal lives, Mark, we, you know, I, I don't wanna pay more for a refrigerator than I have to. I'll, I'll look for President's Day deals or, or Costco's got, you know, $1,000 off something. Um, we buy a car, we negotiate, we buy a house, we don't want to pay more than we have to. We want to try to negotiate down, right? Mm -hmm. 
Private equity is no different, and some of them certainly more aggressive in their approaches to, all right, tell them this to get them really excited and then we'll just chip away. Um, you don't have that in an ESOP scenario. Mm. The trustee does not have an economic incentive, they don't get a gold star, they don't get a pat on the back, they don't get an attaboy by driving the price down. Now, Department of Justice will sue them or Department of Labor will sue them if they pay too much, so, so there's that, that natural tension. But as long as they feel comfortable that it's a fair market value, that they get a um, fairness opinion from their mm -hmm. financial advisors, mm -hmm. it's not this contentious process mm. where you're banging heads and, and beating people up and trying to play gotcha. Yeah. So when I have that client that walked away from a private equity process and is, is working with us and we get to closing, the, the, the universal sentiment said in a bunch of different ways is, oh my gosh, I didn't actually believe you would deliver this. If I had known about ESOPs and, and how it works, I, I, that would have been the first thing I had done. I would have never lost 18 months of my life to that bullshit yeah. private equity process. Yeah. And again, I, there are some wonderful firms out there that do great work on the private equity side, but there are plenty that, that, that don't. So, um, all right, so we ha I added a uh, one... Um, I don't know, trigger. So no clear path, yep. succession, two mil EBITDA or better, mm -hmm. um, or bigger. Uh, fair market value is a, is all they need. Uh, have a high degree of care for their staff and their the culture they've built, and they want to maintain that and it'd be good to them and so forth. Um, they believe in the future of the biz, where mm -hmm. they so they they know that the business has a has a uh, a trajectory yeah, that defensible niche that's that, positive. They, that they, yeah. they feel good about right Their staff etc have a good understanding of the market they're in the strategy they're implementing uh how to grow and manage and and orchestrate so to speak and then kind of that last point is um some i'm gonna call this a mid-term glide path so for the owner yeah right? so like four to six years Two, two to six years. It, it it doesn't even have to be that long. I don't want people to feel like they 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 they're trapped in that you know they can the, jump like right out. I, I've had I've had I had an owner mm -hmm. on a plane to Florida, bef two weeks before the deal closed. Wow. Now okay, he had been going to Florida for the previous yeah. two years yeah. because he had a management team in yeah. place. He had a president. He had a thirty year CFO. Yeah. Now he was still engaged. He was yeah. you know obviously with teams and and email and you, you can get plenty of information. So. Sure. He wasn't suddenly just gone in the wind, mm -hmm. but he felt comfortable at the business. Yeah. So you can absolutely do that. Sure. So it could be pretty quick. Absolutely. Uh, or if, if you have the management team mm -hmm. and you feel comfortable, because again, the the economic um, drivers there are, are the seller note. The, the the seller has to feel comfortable that whether it's him or his management. And I don't mean to be sexist. I, mm -hmm. Sure. It's it, it. it's quicker than saying him and her or right. whatever. Right. 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 Um, that that their management team. Mm -hmm. is strong enough to, to and sometimes it, it, you have to bridge that. That's why you, mm -hmm. I see the vast majority of my clients, again, part, they're, they're not emotionally ready to just walk away. Yeah. Um, and, or they, they, they want to keep an eye on the, uh, on the business as a seller note. And yeah. what happens is, you know, usually you get a, a couple chunks of that seller note paid and, and their, their angst level comes way down and yeah. But they're close to walking away, yes. right? Or well, they yeah. see it out there. Sure. You, you don't look. It, it, one of the things I, I should should have added to uh, criteria. Typically, we say an owner that's fifty five or older. Mm. Okay. Um, and why the is that? Because of the retirement? Just, just it, it, they're looking for an exit. Okay. Right. It's it's if you're forty years old, you, you're probably having fun what you're doing, and you want to continue to grow the business for another. You know, is there a strategic 15. reason for somebody that's, uh, and I have a number of clients that are in their 30s and 40s mm -hmm. uh, that are, you know, for various reasons have done well. Right. Uh, is there a strategic reason for someone like that? I mean, assuming we're checking these boxes uh, to do an ESOP and then move on to other engagements, I, other. I, I, absolutely. So, so that's a unique, obviously, uh, uh, subset. Not, not terribly common. Not terribly co common, but yeah, if they've done well enough and they, and they want to go do other things, yeah. okay, um, absolutely. Or, and I, I didn't really touch on this, but in an ESOP scenario, you can sell in an ESOP transaction, you can sell between zero and 100% of the business. Okay. It's not all or nothing. Huh. So the 
Uh, 1042 tax advantage, you have to sell at least 30% of the business mm -hmm. at a minimum. Okay. So a lot of times we'll see uh, a very small, sometimes you'll see a five or 10% ESOP perhaps, just they just wanna get some shares for the employees. They just, mm. a lot of times those are just granted. It's called a contributory ESOP where they just contribute shares. Then it typically jumps up to a, a 30% because if you're gonna do 28, do 30, and then you get the tax advantage. Mm -hmm. Some and there are trade offs to doing less than 100%, um, but sometimes it meets the objectives, right? And I'm I, that's our goal is to meet the objectives of the owner. And then a lot of times after 30, we'll see 45 to 49% because many of the owners or sellers want to feel like they still control it. Mm. So I've got 51%, I, I control the business, right? Mm -hmm. So mm. And we'll have some clients that will go that route. We'll, we typically, if that's their only issue, we'll, we'll counsel them to do more because it doesn't really matter. But if they're, they're strident in, in doing a 45%, we're happy to do it. And a lot of times we'll get a call a year or two later and they're like, yeah, this is great, let's do the rest. Because what they understand is, and it gets to the question I, I alluded to earlier, uh, the, the role of the trustee. Mm. So I have many of our clients worried about selling and the, what's the role of the trustee Who, who's this trustee person and and are they going to be you know up my shorts mm. trying to tell me how to run my business because again most of our clients are folks that have not reported to anyone in 30 or 40 years mm -hmm. so the notion of of mm -hmm. you know having to there you go suddenly report to somebody is is daunting and you know we we smile politely and then and they're they're reporting to the trustee or they don't and and yeah that's so so explain the trustee thing it, yep so the trustee serves as a fiduciary of the trust and and their role is to ensure that the employee that the beneficiaries of the trust which are the employees are being treated fairly at closing that the the purchase price isn't egregious or unfair to mm -hmm. the employees and that any transactions during the course of the ESOP uh, are are fair to the employees that they're not being taken advantage of somehow. Mm -hmm. So they they're serving simply as a fiduciary, but not in any management sense they, or no their role strategic it, sense not at all. Okay, uh, you know they have this is their profession to be an ESOP trustee. Okay, they don't even sit on the board. Okay, they appoint board members at the discretion of. Um, or, and we say board, you say board of advisors or board of owners, bo board of directors. Okay. Um, you, you'll typically have a three or five person board. If it's a bigger company, perhaps seven. Um, if you've got multiple owners that all want to be on, uh, we've got one where there's four owners. Mm -hmm. So we end up having a, uh, nine person, no, a, a seven person board, mm -hmm. but, um, it, it is an official board. Mm -hmm. Um, it and sounds much more formal than it, than it. Yeah. has to be does Lazier uh, and is this maybe this is two questions but first of all does Lazier uh, your company help put that board together for one uh, we, we, we can yeah many of our owners have um, candidates that they're already thinking about yeah. uh, but we're, we're certainly yeah. happy to assist in that yeah. absolutely so that's a gap I see a lot where where these right. operators owners operators are not typically very good at, uh, or very, well, I think it, it sounds good right. to say, hey, let's put together a board of folks that can help speak into this thing right? Uh, and be a sounding, par uh, a third party yeah. objective, yep. but with context, with maybe market experience in this particular business mm -hmm. type, but objective and out, out of it enough to say, hey, this looks dumb, this looks good, right. whatever. Why'd you hire that person uh, right. at a key leadership role? Or, hey, why are you putting this product out? Or, hey, why'd you buy that right. particular uh, you know, location or whatever? Yep. But they like that idea, but they're really bad at actually First of all, putting that together, they right. put yes. you know, yes people. You don't want that, absolutely, right. 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 And second of, second of all, they aren't very good at then uh, interacting with them. Uh, they don't like being held accountable it's, sometimes yeah, by yeah. boards. It's, it, it, it's, it's kind it's, of a two-edged sword. Right. I, I will tell you what we've seen is usually um, there's not much drama the first couple years. 
Yeah. Because you're, you're, you, you, you know, you're doing what you've done to, mm. that's made you successful in the first place. You're paying down debt aggressively and the owner typically is starting to move out. You know, by, by year three, uh, a lot of owners are, are, are half time, part time. Um, and, and the board is really setting future strategic direction. And, and a lot of times the owners actually embrace it because mm -hmm. to your point, a lot of times they've gotten to a certain point of, of mm -hmm. competence. And as the company's growing, it's, it's, it's growing beyond them. And the board helps, helps make that transition yeah. smoother, helps support the um, existing management team as, as the owner yeah. eases out. Sure. Uh, so let's walk through, and if I, I guess I, I think about this from a, again, from the perspective of somebody's got this $10 million, maybe I'm thinking revenue. Cause as I'm mm -hmm. coaching, you know, that's, it's revenue, it's profit, it's yep. produ productivity. It's, uh, you know, are we putting together good systems and processes? Mm -hmm. Can we grow a, in a healthy right. way? I'm not really, um, uh, working with them around value right uh, you know like all right what's the what's the net worth or the or the book value or whatever you call that yep. of this business um, although it's worth them thinking about it right but they're usually so far in the weeds and they're so much into firefighting that that whole idea is just mystifying to them it, other and, than and it's wrong too right. right they're like it's worth 20 million bucks like buddy i think it's worth two maybe <laughs> You know? it, it, yeah, it, you know, it's a, it, we call it the country club effect, right? Their they're, they're buddy at the club yeah. walks around and I sold my business for 10 times, sold the private equity for 10 times. Yeah. Maybe, but. Yeah, he's bragging. Right? <laughs> probably not. And 10 yeah. times what? Yeah. Um, right. So, yeah, many times there are uh, uh, misperceptions on, on, on value. But that's part of what we do up front is um, our, our typical process you know, when we, we um, get introduced to a potential client, uh, it, typically a three-step process. The first being just an introductory call. If, mm -hmm. if you've got a client and a lot of times we'll hop on a team's call or if they're close, we'll, we'll meet, we'll have lunch or something and we'll just talk. I'll ask a lot of questions about, you know, their business and, and what their goals and objectives are. And, and I'll talk obviously about ESOPs and, and, and address some of their questions. And if they, remain interested at the end of that sort of initial discussion, typically a next step would be to, for me to come in and do what we call our, our intro to ESOPs presentation. So it's uh, sort of a 25 page PowerPoint deck that you know, has a number of charts and graphs and, and, it, and it walks them through, uh, obviously a couple slides on who we are, but then it really walks them through the process of doing an ESOP, but it, it's it's generic because it's not mm -hmm. specific to the company. Mm -hmm. And I think most companies at the end of that say, wow, I'm, I, yeah, this sounds awesome, I get it. Mm -hmm. And what we want to make sure is clear to them that, you know, you don't get your full value in cash at closing. You've got to carry this seller note. We have charts on uh, show how that seller note gets repaid. Mm -hmm. uh, but if they say, yeah, this sounds great, what does it mean for, for me and my business? That third step is a, an in-depth analysis we call a feasibility analysis, FA. And in an FA, it takes us, you know, depending on uh, quality of information, availability of management and all that, and, and our bandwidth, uh, four to six weeks to pull together. And in it, we are going to provide, uh, hopefully address any question that they would have about an ESOP and what it means for them. So expected value at close, how much cash at closing, mm -hmm. what the seller note looks like, uh, expected seller note repayment timing, um, what warrants might be worth, and that's part of a seller note uh, calculation, uh, what it means for the employees, mm -hmm. um, value in five, 10, and 15 years for the employees, uh, and really any other sort of specific question that they may have uh, is generally addressed in that feasibility yeah. analysis. Mm -hmm. uh, we do that present it to the, the, the client, and if at the end of that they say, wow, this is awesome, and they, they generally do. I mean, it's, it's they, you know, a lot of times they can't believe it. They ask a lot of very pointed questions about this tax treatment or whatnot. We, we walk mm -hmm. them through it very specifically. And at the end, if they, they say, this is what I wanna do, 
Uh, at that point, we become engaged. We'll get a, a retainer to, to start our work. And from there to closing is typically four months. Mm. And we'll, we'll close the transaction and then we're paid a success fee at the conclusion of the transaction. So it's like maybe a six month process or so? Yeah, I've actually had processes that were five months from the time I met him. I, wow. The owner has to be dialed in, dialed in and ready to go. Yeah. Not yeah. thinking about it, yeah, yeah. you know, they're, they're seeking an answer mm -hmm. for succession plan, for liquidity. Mm -hmm. um, I, I had one, an accountant introduced me to, to one of their clients and I got done with my intro to ESOPs and wonderful gentleman, 80 years old, had tears in his eyes. Mm. He said, this is exactly what I've been looking for. Wow. I didn't know about this wow. because he was very paternalistic. Mm towards the employees. Mm -hmm. um, it was a great number mm -hmm. uh, for him yeah. and, and his family. And he said, this is exactly what I want to do. I wanted, I've wanted my company to remain in it. Uh, and I'll give you, I, I have noted a very unique dynamic that many of my clients are folks that the notion of selling their baby, the company that they launched, you know, it's, it's their baby mm -hmm. or the family business that grandma and grandpa founded mm -hmm. or great grandma yeah. grandpa founded and, and now it's an heirloom it's a family heirloom oh God, you, you know the notion of handing that off mm -hmm. to those those wicked evil private equity guys right. or right. a strategic buyer that's yeah. just going to move the production right. equipment to, to their own plant and fire everybody else right right turn makes their head explode turns right. their stomach right. so a lot of these folks it, it, it's crazy mark they 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 just stick their head down mm -hmm. And when people, their advisory group, whether it's you or their, their wealth manager, or their tax says, Hey, you know, what, what are your, let's talk about succession planning. No, no, I'm not, I'm not ready yet. I'm not ready yet mm -hmm. because in their mind, they only have two options. Right. And suddenly they're introduced. And this was the case with the gentleman I told you that tears in his eyes. He had no concept that there was something like this yeah. that checked every single box mm. he was looking for. Yeah. And so if they're dialed in like that and, and, and ready, it was five months from the time I met him. We, we, you know, we, 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 their information was great. So we got the FA done and in, in four months, uh, four weeks rather, and signed us up right away. Didn't have to mm -hmm. think about it. Said, yep, let's go. And, and it was a great transaction. We closed in, in four months. Wow. So others, I will tell you, I, I my, uh, <laughs> my, my, uh, West coast opportunity. Uh, I talked to that owner for two and a half years before we closed. Mm. Just, he was very wary of anything, any third party sale. Yeah. It was a family business founded by his father. Uh, he was 70 and, and, you know, looking for options, a uh, small community, wanted to preserve jobs, wanted mm -hmm. to you know, keep the name over the, they had mm -hmm. a way of doing things known for mm -hmm. high quality. Um, but it took him, it took him a while yeah. to, 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 to get comfortable. Well, with those are the good guys, right? I oh, mean, absolutely. It should. It they should care. take them a while. They care. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. I mean, if you're going to be, I mean, if, 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 if it's going to check all the boxes really clearly, great. But uh, somebody that cares is going to have, they're going to take it slow, right? They're going to they're gonna be cautious. Absolutely. And yeah. Vet, right? And, and I tell folks, you're never going to get any pressure from me. I, I am not that guy that's, mm -hmm. I'm going to touch base. Once a quarter, mm -hmm. hey, how you doing? How are things? How's the business? Mm -hmm. Any questions? Yeah. Great. Okay. Hope. Yeah. Hope everything's well. Reach out next. You know, next quarter. So you walk through. So the intro call, et cetera, et cetera. And this could take as little as, and this would be smoking fast, right? Four months, five months. Yes. Yeah. Right. And that's if everybody's. Everybody's charged up, and ready to go, and understands yep, and yep. F everything. Five, you know, from, from from the time we have an initial conversation to, to closing, you know, you think five to six months is, okay. is a pretty okay. typical. And then um, you guys engage and you do all this work, uh, legal, technical, practical. There's uh, there's there's a lot to it. Yep. Uh, banking, etc. Yep. Uh, finance. Uh, but then after the after the thing happens. Mm -hmm. Um, as a firm, do you stay, how, what's your involvement that's, that's a, down the road? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's evolved, mm. um, actually fairly recently. So in a, <laughs> excuse me, in a traditional sense, <laughs> you know, investment bankers hired 
to execute a transaction. Mm -hmm. So we <coughs> um, process a transaction, we get to closing, we have a nice celebration. Mm -hmm. And historically, that's where our official engagement ends. Mm -hmm. Now, I get calls from former clients all the time, and I, mm -hmm. frankly, I love to get those calls. Mm -hmm. It's great to catch up. They'll call with a specific question. Mm -hmm. um, many times I, I can help them or point them in the right direction. Other times, I, you know, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm going to have to check in on that. Um, but we hadn't had an official role. Please, yeah. A little more. That's good. Thank you. Perfect. Um, about a year ago, we, we recognized that we, because we, what we do, we, 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 our role, we, we talk about quarterbacking the transaction. We coordinate all the professionals, the lawyers, the accountants, the tax people, uh, negotiate with the trustee and the valuation firm, and we raise the debt financing. So we're quarterbacking that transaction. And, and most of these folks are Lazier folks. No, no, no. These are all third-party professionals. Okay, yeah. okay. So the key is we have, I talked about our, my great colleagues, very smart, accomplished, experienced professionals that, that sit down in Columbus with all this you know, tax and, and accounting and, and valuation and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, but we don't provide, we don't do tax opinions, we don't provide legal opinions, we don't do accounting work. We just have that knowledge so that when we're structuring, we know how to do it. And what we do is we work very collaboratively with our clients' own advisors. A lot of times they'll have a wealth manager or they'll have a tax professional and, and we'll coordinate mm. what we're doing and structuring to make sure that it's congruent with their estate planning and, and, and wealth plans and that their tax professional who ultimately is going to do the tax return is comfortable with what we're doing, right? So having that experience and expertise in-house for us is awesome because it makes it, they don't want me talking to the tax professionals, my tax guys talks to them, right? And, and, and so, yeah. but we use uh, outside professionals Got it. to do all this, right? How often, uh, from your perspective, do you see folks uh, that you're dealing with principals here mm -hmm. that just don't have a great, they don't have a great network of those folks, close, yeah. trusted, uh, proficient uh, advisors uh, yeah, yeah a lot of you know we i'm sure you see it it's yeah. it's it's the brother-in-law who's a real estate attorney right right, right. good guy knows real yeah. estate but but not necessarily right, right here that's fine we, we can introduce them mm -hmm. to you know professionals mm -hmm. if if they need them uh, uh yeah. certainly you know tax and estate planning is, is pretty critical mm -hmm. here but you know those professionals help us get the deal done and then my, my point was about a year ago we recognized that we didn't have an official uh, a service post closing, and we recognized that that was probably a hole in, in our in servicing our clients. We got a great transaction done, and then post closing, they're going to have a trustee that that they can rely on. Um, they're going to work with a TPA, third party administrator, that will track uh, you know account balances, investing schedules, and, and all that. And then you'll have your ERISA, your ESOP attorney, mm -hmm. but none of those folks, professionals, are looking big picture and, and, and helping the client. They're just being responsive to questions. So we hired a gentleman, sits up in Detroit uh, today. Jeff had, um, had been the CFO at an electrical contractor in the Detroit area. And his owner, 100% owner, came to him and said, Jeff, I want to do, uh, do an ESOP. So, so figure out how, how we do this, get, get the right people, and, and let's, let's make this happen. Mm -hmm. He had read articles and whatever, mm -hmm. and sort of tasked Jeff to do it. Somebody of Vistage, like, hey, do an ESOP. Right. So Jeff, not, no, you know, he, he, he got some professionals, and, and, and they, they, they cobbled together a deal. And this mm -hmm. was uh, certainly a number of years ago. So Jeff was a CFO that was helped really leading that process. He served as a CFO, then as an ESOP company, for the next six years after mm -hmm. closing, mm -hmm. the owner, the seller note was paid off in full, and the owner said, "Okay, I'm good. I'm, you know, it's yours." Jeff was elevated to president and CEO of the business, which he ran for the next six years. Mm. So he had 12 years as an ESOP. Plus, uh, he was there, I think, 10 years prior to that. He came out of, uh, I think, Big Four, mm -hmm. the CFO at the company. So he retired. He had, a, it, you know, the ESOP was very, very good to him. Um, 
He, he, he loved what it did for all the employees, the culture of the company, but he, he, you know, it was time to retire and he did. And he said, you know, I really, I, I love ESOPs. I, I want to stay involved in some fashion. And he bumped into one of my, co my colleague who I have a colleague who sits in Detroit and, um, um, started talking eventually, uh, we brought him on board on, uh, Lazier and he works with our companies post-closing. As part of our engagement, um, he'll work, uh, he'll provide 40 hours of, of consulting service at no charge mm -hmm. to those clients in whatever fashion they may need. There's no preset agenda. Some folks struggle with, we talked earlier, uh, building a board. Mm -hmm. how, how, you know, how do we do a board? Mm -hmm. What should a board meeting look like? What would an agenda include? Because they've never done it in the past. So he can help with that. Others are, um, uh, communication, employee communication, which, by the way, is, is incredibly critical. You, you, you know, you really have to communicate uh, often, you know, repeatedly and clearly to the employees about what an ESOP is and, and what yeah. it means and what it isn't. Yeah. Um, and any other sort of issues that come up, accounting treatment, because he was a former CFO, so he understands it intimately, right? Mm -hmm. um, but Jeff is a great resource for our clients, and we've we filled that that gap post closing. Now, a lot of times I'll get the first call and then I'll you know I'll reach out to Jeff, uh, but Jeff will have an engagement with uh, with their clients at no cost. And if they want to continue to work with him post close, use him as a as a resource. He's certainly available mm -hmm. to do that. But I think it's been a great addition mm -hmm. to because we do I, we do a killer job of of getting a great transaction done, and now we're only enhancing that by having Jeff involved and and holding their hands, because what we found is that first year as an ESOP is, it's all new to the clients. They've never been an ESOP before, so they don't know the cadence of, of board meetings, of filings, of what you have to do, mm -hmm. and Jeff is there to, to, to mm -hmm. be very helpful. So it's it's so a great- is Jeff working with the uh, the, the uh, company? Yeah. And and the owner, or either, either or? It, I mean, really both, I mean, it's the owner and the company are still mm -hmm. They're intertwined. Yeah, so. I mean, he's running it. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of times, there's an ESOP committee that's formed mm -hmm. of, of employees, and mm -hmm. and uh, you know, com as I said, communication is 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 critical and important. You know, I've it's funny. I, I was talking about ESOPs to to a gentleman, and he said, "Wait a minute, why in the hell would I do an ESOP and and have some welder out on the plant floor telling me how to run my business?" Mm -hmm. And I and you know, and I chuckled, of course, because I know that. That's not how it works. It, mm -hmm. Being an ESOP doesn't give the employees any more rights mm -hmm. or or uh, uh, ability to mm -hmm. tell anybody. They don't get to choose yeah. the coffee or yeah. what markets to go to or how much everybody should be paid. They are beneficial owners and they have an economic interest, but just like any public company, mm -hmm. you have a management structure and, yeah. and that stays in place, yeah, yeah. right? So so they don't, it, they don't suddenly get the right to yeah. To tell you how to run the business. Yeah, it's not a democracy. Right. Pure exactly. democracy. Right. So that was one of the questions I want to ask you. Um, so, uh, and I want to get to that. So kind of how operationally, what operationally changes. Uh, but before that, talk a little bit more about the trustee. So the trustee, mm -hmm. who appoints a trustee? Great question. So trustees are, uh, are, are people that, this is their, their, their job to serve as ESOP trustees, much like law firms or accounting firms. Mm -hmm. um, they vary from the, the big brand name, shiny, you know, 50 or 100 person trustee firms mm -hmm. down to a single shingle professional and, and mm -hmm. everything in between. So mm -hmm. what we will typically do is based upon our exposure to the owner and our view of, of their style and comfort level, mm -hmm. we'll introduce two or three trustee candidates for them to interview, okay. Can and, they bring and, their own, or they, can they kind of go, "Hey, how about this guy?" Sure. Yeah, I mean, we're happy happy to do that. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, most don't know any trustees. Yeah. That, you know, it, it's someone foreign to them. So, so we'll introduce candidates. We'll sit with them and we'll interview them, and then ultimately that owner decides who he or she wants to work with, who, okay. who what trustee they want to engage. So it's the owner's decision. Owner's decision. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Mm -hmm. Then the own then that trustee gets engaged, and then we are representing the seller and we're negotiating with that trustee on a purchase price and other terms and conditions okay. of, the, of the sale. And the trustee's job is what? They serve, again, as a fiduciary 
of the trust, making sure uh, two just major things. One, that uh, the original transaction or the initial transaction is being done at, at a fair market value, that the employees aren't being burdened, you know, paying $20 million for a business that's worth 15. Mm -hmm. Got it. That's a no-no. That's their, their, their... And how's the trustee paid? Is it it's like a contract? Yeah, they, 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 fee, have a, fee fee they have a transaction fee, and then on an ongoing basis, okay. they'll have a retainer. Okay. Right. Got it. And then in addition to the trustee, they will hire their own valuation firm, mm -hmm. outside independent third-party valuation firm, that firm will provide the trustee a fairness opinion at closing. Okay. And it's a firm that, that carries you know, liability insurance and it's a professional valuation firm mm -hmm. that says, given all facts and circumstances, we believe this price and the terms and conditions are fair. Yeah, it's all above fair. board. Above yeah, board, exactly, sure. yeah. So, and you had mentioned that Lazier kind of quarterbacks this thing. Right. So, so let's say trustee X and uh, you know, uh, the firm that's ev uh, evaluating the company, right. you guys have some, some difference of opinion. Uh, where are like, well, I think it's worth this. No, I think it's worth that. No, I think it's you know ABC. Do you kind of, as a firm, does Lazier kind of like work that until it gets all figured out? We, we do, absolutely. Okay. But right. but that's part of what, you know, having our, you know, my colleagues down in Columbus, the, 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 the very smart and experienced people, including a couple of valuation folks that used to be former, Okay. we, we brought them in-house. Yeah. People yeah. ask all the time, do you guys do valuations for ESOPs? Mm -hmm. And I say, well, it's, it, it, it's a nuanced answer. We don't do capital V valuations. We don't serve the trustee community, mm -hmm. but we do our own internal valuation. We do our guys, my valuation guys do the same work mm -hmm. that they did when they were on the other side. Yeah. So when we tell a client, we believe your business is worth 20 million, you know, between 18 and 22 with a target of 20 million. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We believe that the yeah. valuation community broadly will concur with us, that yeah. it will be in that range. Yeah, sure, you're dialed in. Right, okay. right. So, but yeah, we, we have to negotiate, and our job is to advocate for our clients and mm -hmm. provide every fact and, and bit of data and information that we can to, to help, help them see the value. Yeah. And it's, at some level, it's no different than if we're selling the company to private equity or strategic. You know, we're, yeah. we're advocating for our, for our yeah. clients. But the, we also recognize, though, at the end of the day, the the buyer can't pay more than a, a, a fair market value. Mm -hmm. Right. So talk about the ESOP committee a little bit. So these are these are employees. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. We found best practices to be uh, many companies will will establish an ESOP committee of of various levels. You'll, you'll have um, perhaps not a senior management, but 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 some level management mm -hmm. all the way down to shop floor. And it can be three people, it can be 10 people, but mm. they sort of get some extra ESOP education, if you will. They may go to some of the local conferences mm -hmm. to pick up information and whatnot. And, and they then will, will help communicate to the employees um, uh, what the ESOP means okay. and, and, and they'll help uh, address questions. They'll help mm -hmm. get people excited about it. Because I, it, it, what's, what's really interesting is we've seen some really cool uh, reveals, mm. right? Where just like any third party sale, many times it's, it's that information is being held in a very small group, the owner and maybe a couple senior managers. But at the end, the owner is so excited and they, they want to do a really cool reveal. Uh, I've been in one where, um, it was a, it was a metal, uh, uh, metal working mm -hmm. facility and they, they had a big, uh, mm. uh, stainless steel sheet that they, they, they polished up. Mm. So like a mirror, and they had it behind a curtain, and they were up, and they called everybody into the you know the the break room, and said, "Hey, I just want to let you know, you know, there's been some rumors. We've sold the company, Oof. right?" And everybody's yeah. you know murmur, murmur, right, you know, right, right. Oh, what's yeah, that mean? Yeah, oh yeah. God, change. Yeah, uh, we'd like to introduce you to to the new owners, and then they they part the curtain, and it, basically it's a mirror there reflecting all of them. And they're <laughs> what? 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 Uh, yeah, uh, that's great. You're the new owners, you know. I'm like, well, what does that mean? Right. right. And, and, and you have to communicate that. I, I, uh, another one um, was really fun. Uh, they called everybody in, in, in a couple hundred employees, uh, brought them in. 
a state senator was there. I mean, it, wow. it, you know, they knew something was going on. Mm. All right, well, the company's been sold. We, we'd like to introduce you to the, um, the new owners. Please stand up. Everybody stood up and, you know, they're looking around like, who, who is it? You know, what's this going to mean? Um, please turn to your right, uh, you know, to, to shake, shake the hand of the person on your left, to turn to shake the person on, you've met your, your new owners. Well, what's this mean? You know, and, yeah. Yeah, you know, people can cheer and others don't understand what it means. Right. And, and so the ESOP commu uh, yeah. committee will help do s stuff like that. A lot of times, uh, October, I believe, I think it's October is uh, ESOP month. Mm. And so they'll do a lot of times fun things and, and, and games to just keep yeah. people aware that, yeah. but because the key is, I, I tell folks, hey, congratulations, you, you, you're now an ESOP, you're now a, a beneficial owner of the company, but show up tomorrow and, and, and do your job and do your job the next day and the next week and next month, next year, because it's a long-term retirement benefit. So you're not gonna go buy a new truck this summer based upon being an ESOP. Mm -hmm. You know, you're gonna start earning shares over time that hopefully will grow in value and you'll be every year you get a new allocation of shares mm -hmm. that ultimately when you retire um you know hopefully will will we'll be worth a, a pretty penny i mean i think the folks at, at garland as i alluded mm -hmm. to earlier are, are probably pretty stoked right yeah. of, of their yeah, balances yeah. um but it's a long term yeah you don't you don't want and many times uh, people are very worried well, what's this mean you know is my 401k getting cut or my benefits or yeah the typical answer is absolutely not. Right. Nothing changes. It's not changes. connected to that, it, right? It's not. It's, it's an incremental benefit yeah. that they don't pay for. Yeah. So if, for, from my understanding, this is a this is a, uh, a financial mechanism or a retirement mechanism or a wealth mechanism, right? It's not. It's in that space yeah. of the wealth management sure. side of things. Uh, so, so walk through from an employee's standpoint now. I think we covered the owner... Right. side right fairly well so so as a as a staff member and let's say you're you know a welder let's say yep. you're the janitor let's say you're the mid-level manager of uh you know uh, uh, a mid-level project manager sure right uh supply chain guy whatever you want to call somebody that's we're not talking ceo we're not talking president we're not talking cfo we're mm -hmm. not talking vp of biz dev but we're talking some boots on the ground yep. folks Yep. Uh, and let's say there's 75 employees right. and, and, and you're one of the folks that show up at 730 and open the doors and, and make product roll out, right? Um, and so they hear this. The, the, the folks actually doing the work. Yeah, right. They're, they're, they're yep. turning the crank yep. on a business. Um, and they hear about this ESOP thing and they're, let's just say, 45 years old. Yep. Um, and making, I don't know, 75,000 a year. Yep. Uh, benefits, et cetera, and uh, driving a, you know, a 2015 F-150, mm -hmm. um, and they're, you know, on a softball team, right? Your standard yeah. dude yep. or gal, right? right. And uh, they go home and like, hey, just heard right. we've got this ESOP thing going on. Yep. Uh, and the spouse is like, well, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. And they say, well, we talked to this committee guy. Right. Uh, and they got this committee and I'll ask them, like, give me your questions. Right. Right. And, um, and so they go to the committee and they say, no, what does this mean right. for me? Uh, what does this mean for me retiring at 64, 65 or 59 and a half or whatever it is? Yep. Uh, what does it mean by, for my 401k? What does right. it mean for so and so, uh, so he goes home, says to his spouse, I found out and now I'm going to. And our plans at 62 to go to Canada or go to Mexico or yep. go to yep. West Virginia, that'd be my plan. I hear you. Um, to the wilds? Yeah, sure. That's right. Uh, and to, to, so here's what it means, right? So they're going to they're gonna work out, work their, they're going to kind of carry their time out for another 15 yep. years. Yep. Um, doesn't affect their health insurance. Right. Doesn't affect their 401k. Right. Uh, and so now they come up on retirement. Now what? Yep. So you, 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 you've laid the groundwork really well. I mean, it, that's exactly it. It's, there is no current cash benefit. Okay. They, they are it's just their shareholders. They, and here, here's something important to, uh, to understand. So, um, and again, I'm a round numbers guy. So l let's say the owner has, has you know, sold 100% of their shares to the ESOP trust. Mm -hmm. Let's say there's 100,000 shares in the trust. Mm-hmm. 
those eShop, <laughs> eShop shares get allocated to eligible employees on an annual basis over 30, 40, 50, 60 years sometimes. Mm -hmm. That's a ERISA testing question that, that mm -hmm. part of what we do with, with the TPA is, is work on that, that uh, length of, of allocation period. Uh, but let's say it's, we allocate over 50 years. And that's a, like a vesting. Yeah, I'm, right. I'm process, gonna, right? So, so there, there's, okay. yeah, there's two things. There's allocation period and then there's vesting period. Okay. So, so yeah, let's talk about it. Um, what's, what's interesting is, and I said it earlier, it, it looks, acts, feels a lot like a 401k plan, right? Mm -hmm. And in fact, it's an employee stock ownership plan. So you will have, there is a plan document just like you have for the 401k. No, nobody reads, you know, they're, they're yeah. 200 pages of, yeah. of gobbledygook. Dude, if you do, you need some medication right? or something. You need a good therapist. Right? Right? <laughs> but ultimately, it, 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 the plan describes uh, who's eligible. Mm. Uh, statutory maximums are, uh, a th you, you have to work 1,000 hours a year and 21 years of age. You can make it anything less. Mm -hmm. Uh, sometimes, in uh, typically, you make it more. Can no, you... no, that's a statu statutory maximum, okay. Okay. right? So you can make it less uh, restrictive, but not more restrictive. Um, typically, we'll match it to whatever your four hundred and one k plan already says, and a lot of times it says you got to work a thousand hours and you got to be twenty one years of age to be an eligible employee. So, and perhaps you've got to work there for six months you know, at least six months. So um, at the end of the year, shares get allocated to eligible employees. So there's two things to understand. One, if we've got 100,000 shares in the trust and we're gonna allocate over 50 years, that means we're gonna allocate 2,000 shares per year over 50 years and that will allocate the 100,000 shares, right? Okay. okay, so at the end of the first year, we're gonna allocate 2,000 shares mm -hmm. to the eligible employees. Well, how do we decide who gets how many shares, right? So it's an ERISA governed plan, which means it has to be non-discriminatory. Mm -hmm. So the owner doesn't get to decide, well, I like yeah. Tim, but I don't like Bob. So he's it's not arbitrary. Not arbitrary. It's, it's very it has to be fair okay. or equal. Uh, vast majority, 99 point something percent of companies typically will use a W-2 allocation formula okay. that says, Mark, if you and I are employees of an ESOP company and your W-2 is twice as large as mine, mm -hmm. your allocation of shares that year will be twice as large as mine. Maybe you'll get four shares and I'll get two. So they're taking the, let's say it's 2,000 shares, and they're just kind of- Dividing it up. Distributing them. Distributing them. Based right. on some scale. And it goes to your account, Okay. right? So you don't tangibly, you don't hold the shares, they're just in your account. Okay. Now the next year, if I get a raise, mm -hmm. a commission, a bonus, mm -hmm. whatever, my W-2 matches yours, then that year, I'll get the same allocation of shares as you do. It's, it's relative, yeah. your, yeah. your percentage of W-2 against the total eligible mm -hmm. payroll period, okay. right? Payroll pool, rather. Um, and those shares get allocated to your account. They're also then subject to a vesting schedule. Okay. Right? Again, subject to the same rules as your 401k is. The maximum is a six year graded period. So 0% the first year, 20, 40, 60, 80, 100% at the end okay. of the six year. So you or, gotta stick with it. Yeah, right. It, again, it's- So if you quit within that period of time, you don't get any shares. You're, just like your 401k, you are always entitled to your own contributions. Now in an ESOP, you don't have any. Mm -hmm. And you're entitled to your vested portion okay. of the employer got match. It. Okay, right? got it. Same thing here. So you are entitled to your vested portion of shares. Mm -hmm. um, but if, if you're sticking it out, you're, you're, that 15 years, you, you're, you'll be completely vested. You hit retirement age. And, and what I should, actually I should add, one of the functions of an ESOP uh, process is every year, the ESOP is required to get an updated valuation, typically by that same valuation firm that did the original deal. Doesn't have to be, but mm -hmm. most times it's the same firm. They do an update valuation. And so they say, okay, this year, the company's worth X. Mm -hmm. Your share balance is Y, mm -hmm. your vested balance is X dollars. Mm -hmm. And each year it gets updated. Okay. Now, one of the things to understand that employees, that's important for the employees to understand is out of the gate, there's very little equity value, mm -hmm. right? 
my example, my $10 million business with 3 million of senior bank debt mm -hmm. plus a seven, $7 million, mm -hmm. it's subordinated, so I should put yeah, it below. Yeah. $7 million, you've got a $10 million business that's got $10 million of debt. So there's, there, there's no equity value at it's closing, not, yeah, right? Yeah. Now, as you pay that debt, it's just like a house, yeah. right? If, if, if you bought a house with a mortgage from a bank for 300,000 and, and you know, your parents gave you 200,000 mm -hmm. and the house is worth 500, the house is a $500,000 house, but there's no equity value in it, right? As you pay that mortgage down, mm -hmm. you create equity value. The house doesn't even have to appreciate, you're just paying yeah. down debt. Yeah. And if the house appreciates, mm -hmm. you also get value there. So it's a sideways funnel, right? Yeah. The employees can control the value of the business by operating, operating well. it, doing it yeah. well, being sure. profitable, right? Sure. Okay. So over time, that valuation in theory should go up. That said, uh, an ESOP company, just like a public company, just like the public stock markets, you, can, mm -hmm. you know, can go up and down. You, you mm -hmm. can have a down year, mm -hmm. so your valuation will come down. Now you'll earn more shares, mm -hmm. so perhaps your, your total balance stays flat. Mm -hmm. But over time, you know, generally you see an up and to the right mm -hmm. sort of trend in, in the value. And when that employee retires, the plan documents will specify retirement age, mm -hmm. 62, 65, you know, whatever mm -hmm. it may be. Um, when that employee retires, the company is obligated to, to purchase their shares back at the fair market value. Okay. There and, you go. and they use that valuation that's that's derived. So, but it, they have to be vested to purchase them back. They they, they purchase the vested balance back. Yes. Got it. Now, okay. once once you've achieved your your if it's a six year graded, once you've achieved vested yes, you're, status, you're vesting. they're right. all vested. Yes. Got yeah. it. Yeah. And so, because that was one of my questions. So, so let's say, you know, Bob on the floor, he's yeah. been a welder for X years and he's got X years to go and he's just kind of got this, you know, plan in mind and he's going to go fishing when yep. he's 59 and a half, you yep. know, or whatever, play golf or whatever. I like that plan. Right. Fishing sounds better yes. than golf. You but, and me, you and me both. Right. Or, or With my back, plays I'm not going to be doing a whole lot of golfing anymore. Yeah, right, 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 right. And I would rather invest, by the way, in fishing or sporting clays or yes. something like that than golf. Like any money I invest in golf is money ill spent, right? <laughs> so I enjoy it, but- uh, uh, Cheers to that. You know, right. I'm yeah. a I'm a 18 handicap, at least the last time I measured it, and it's probably not gotten any better <laughs> right. from there. So, right. so um, and and I went and played golf with uh, Brandon, or not played golf, I went and did sporting clay, clays with Brandon Kenny. Oh yeah. And I was like, this is what I should be doing. And I'm, not, I am also not good at sporting clays, but I like it better. Well, uh, and absolutely. I'd rather work at that. It, it, is, it is absolutely, in my mind, yeah. a way better mm. um, networking, mm -hmm. team building, whatever you yeah. want to call it, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. endeavor. Because sure. you're together, the whole, you yeah. know, you're in the cart, the whole, yeah. whole circuit. Sure. Sure. And I've always said, missing a clay pigeon is a lot less frustrating than shanking yeah, Golf sure. Ball into the lake. And we're shooting right? a gun, right? You're Come shooting on, a gun, right? right? It's a hoot. Yeah, I agree. I have to have you out to my property. Okay, yeah, um, yes, we've talked about this. Because I have a, um, I took my, uh, I have two throwers okay. now, uh, clay throwers. Yeah. That are cheap and good. They're, they're solid. But um, I put them in the back of my side-by-side. -side, yep. And you could turn them all Ooh, different yeah, ways. Yeah, of course, right, right. And so we just drive around the property and we park it in different spots. Yeah, and you shoot it out over so the valley. The come at you, or out over the river, Love out it. over the whatever. You know, it's yeah. a lot of fun. Would love my kids and son-in-law, et cetera, do that a lot. Great. Um, all right, so so, but I guess the point is right. So so that 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 welder that's forty-five is going to work mm -hmm. for another, you know, mm -hmm. uh, fifteen years. Mm -hmm. um, He'll get vested at some point. Yeah, he's vested, and and and, and when he retires, this. So who's buying the shares back? The company. Okay. Yeah. And, and remember, they, said, is that going in the pool of shares yeah, and that the, gets well, reallocated yeah, the, down the road? That's a great question. The, okay. you, you, you can recycle or you can redeem shares. There. That's some technical discussion. Okay. But as I said. Um, Does the management decide that? Yeah. Down absolutely. the road? Yes. And they work with their TPA to figure out what, okay. what, what we want to do. It. And you, you can adjust. If, okay. if you're on a plan for a couple of years and you're realizing it doesn't work, mm -hmm. you, you know, nothing is carved in granite that can't be changed. That said, you don't want to be willy nilly, you know. Yeah. Change the business is dynamic. Uh, I mean, right? Yes. Uh, competition, uh, innovation, absolutely. all that stuff. Right. You know, it's a big deal. Um, so what are some downsides to uh, an ESOP? Like, what are some ways that as a company's going, going forward five, ten years into ESOP right. 
that where they maybe take take the wrong turn. I mean, the market does what the market does. Um, so yep. what are some ways that a business can accidentally hurt itself ESOP wise? Well, uh, again, I, I think at that point, ESOP is just another form of ownership, right? Okay. And so it, it, it's businesses, as we know, they're dynamic and, and constantly evolving. Um, and ESOP's not a guarantee of, mm -hmm. of success. Mm -hmm. uh, typically, as, as I noted, you, you, you see ESOP companies flourishing. Mm -hmm. um, but if, if the management team, through incompetence, bad luck, or missteps, just whatever, uh, goes down a path and the company struggles, that impacts the share value. Just, mm -hmm. it, it, it's the same as buying, buying, it's the same as holding public company stock. Mm -hmm. Let's talk Kodak 50 mm -hmm. years ago. Mm -hmm. Blue chip. Blue chip. Yeah, big right? time. Right. Not now. Not now. Right. <laughs> right. And 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 so the sh the public shareholders of that stock yeah. suffered. And ESAP company in, yeah. in large measure could be like that. Now yeah. you can throw the big three automakers in here. Two thousand eight. Okay. May right. not be a great time to right. two thousand ten. May right. not be a great time to hold a bunch of auto shares. You know, so um it's a great time to buy them looking backwards. Right? Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. What what I say to folks is um your downside in being part of an ESOP company is zero, hmm. all right? Your upside is some measure limitless. Well, because as a staff member, as an employee, like, well, you're still getting your paycheck, you're still doing your job, you're still... Right, and understand that, that, that you know, and I love conversations initially, sometimes, you know, I'll talk to employees, rank and file employees, mm -hmm. like, well, what, what, what happens um, or my valuation's down this quarter. I, you know, I lost five thousand dollars. You know, I get it. That doesn't feel good. Mm -hmm. But understand, it, 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 it's it's a uh, valuation issue today. But you, you're not realizing that it's it's over time going to bump around. But if the company were to fail, a lot of people say I had I lost a hundred thousand dollars in my ESOP account. Well, let's truly understand what that means. You had 100,000 of value there that, that's no longer there, and that doesn't feel good for anybody, but you actually didn't lose any dollars because you've never invested a dime. Yeah. Now, I'm not here to say, oh, yeah. boo-hoo. Nobody uh, likes that. Qu you know, quit your whining, that's, that's not the case at all. Right. But understand, you, you didn't actually lose invested dollars. Yeah. You, you, you can lose, of course, the value in your account, mm -hmm. and that's not good for anybody. But the biggest downside, the company goes out of business. Yeah, um, and I don't mean to be flip about it. I mean that's that's traumatic. People lose jobs and everything. Yeah. Um, I, I would argue that the company will will not go out of business because of the ESOP, mm -hmm. unless yeah. there's fraud and nefarious sort of dealings. Yeah, you something know, illegal. Excluding something. that, yeah. Um, you know, the, the the worst case scenario is your account is worth zero. Yeah. Um, You've lost opportunity. There's opportunity cost, perhaps, in, in you know, in, yeah. in in your value, but you didn't invest anything. Yeah, you still got your 401k and those 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 funds. It, very rightfully, it should be mm -hmm. uh, safe in you know in in public stocks. You know, outside of the company, um, the company shares could go to zero. That is your biggest downside, mm -hmm. and and that means the ESOP has not been worth anything to you. But you haven't lost any cash money of your own mm -hmm. you haven't invested anything yeah so there's not like a a risk component in the sense that you're putting money in right other than you're just working away you're, you're doing the same job you did you've been doing your yeah. benefits are the same your pay is the same typically the match for the 401k is the yeah. same nothing has changed other than you, you have this opportunity yeah and in, in vast majority of cases that opportunity and, and again some are more than others. Obviously, the you know the Garland example is is, is a shining star on the hill kind of thing, uh, but there are plenty of, of companies where it's it's their accounts are are several hundred thousand dollars. Mm -hmm. um, I'll also add it, there are times where ESOP companies are actually sold. They're in ESOP yeah. for thirty years, and yeah, that was my next question: is what what happens or does it what yeah what paint a picture of. 10, 15 years down the road, uh, the owner's out, the for, first, the, uh, mm -hmm. the founder, et cetera. Mm -hmm. The ESOP's taking its course right. uh, as far as the, the uh, paying back the note and all, right. all that. 
now the the employees it's fully run by the employees fully um right you know operated etc the um and side note decision making so is there uh is the board are there representatives of the business or the of the employees on the board uh and they're making decisions yeah typically you're going to at a minimum on a maturity stop down the road you'll have you know your 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 president who was probably not the owner mm -hmm. you know if you're, you're down the road mm -hmm. cfo will be there so mm -hmm. they are employee owners just mm -hmm. like yeah and the board's putting them in place the board's putting the executive team so the example i use something like that is you know we talk about control uh, many owners are worried about giving up mm -hmm. control mm -hmm. so the example i use is you can be a shareholder in a public company we can own shares of coca-cola yeah. Yeah, we have zero. We own it. We have yeah. zero, right? Yeah. yeah. Even the big hedge funds that own yeah. significant stakes, yeah, they have a degree of influence. But at yeah. the end of the day, they have a voice. But that's it. The shareholders elect a board of directors. Okay. Right. The board of directors appoints, typically the CEO, the operators, who then builds out his yeah. or her team yeah. as he sees fit. Yeah. Same, 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 same thing happens. Okay, right? got it. I, exactly. Yeah, that 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 was one of the things I didn't quite understand. Yeah. So that's that's really interesting. So the the board could say, you know what, folks, we got to sell this thing. This would be good for everybody. It, 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 or it, yes. let's it, go back to non ESOP. Yeah, typically what we've seen where a company transitions out of an ESOP mm -hmm. is. It's one of two scenarios. One, the the company sort of just just. Mm -hmm. bumping along not, not stagnant not, not yeah. stagnant that's mm -hmm. maybe that's a great word and they look at it and say you know we're not really getting out of the the ESOP what we had hoped and mm -hmm. it sort of run its course Let, let's take it private and and you, you know we're, maybe we're going to be a little more nimble mm -hmm. the, at least in their mind they think so but more frequently what we see is the ESOP company is is kicking ass mm. right they're doing really well mm -hmm. they're they're the top Mm -hmm. decile of, of their their competitors mm -hmm. right because everybody's got skin in the game they're all rowing in the same direction that, mm -hmm. that whole notion and they become attractive to mm -hmm. third-party buyers yeah right, right right private equity or strategic and at some point so the role of the trustee this is a, another very important part if that company were to get you know sort of an unsolicited offer mm -hmm. from a strategic buyer or from any buyer um, you know, if it's a legitimate offer backed by a, a legitimate buyer with capital, mm -hmm. they have to consider it. Now, they don't have, just like public companies that get hostile takeover mm -hmm. offers, you know, the board does their work. They Typically, they'll hire an investment banker to help them, you know, evaluate strategic alternatives and options and is this price fair. At the end of the day, if, if the premium to the current stock price, because again, they're getting a, an annual valuation each year, right? Mm -hmm. So you're tracking your value. Mm -hmm. And if your value is $50 million now, you're 15 years down the road and you're $50 million, you paid off all the debt, things are going mm -hmm. great. Mm -hmm. And a buyer comes in and says, we want to pay you $55 million for your business. 10% mm -hmm. premium, you know, I, I don't know. The board's probably going to say, no, we're, we, we like being an ESOP that's not, that's not a compelling offer. The trustee can weigh in on that. If that buyer were to come in and say, we're going to pay you $90 million. Mm -hmm. Now you're talking to my good ear, right? Exactly. <laughs> they, they have to listen to that. They have yeah, to, yeah. And, and they, they do their own yeah. analysis. And, you know, they, they, they talk to uh, advisors. Mm -hmm. and, and perhaps that is compelling enough to say, how do, how do we walk away from... Yeah. Uh, you know, call it 100% premium, 90%, but yeah. whatever it is, right? So going back to that welder guy, so let's sure. say he's 55. Mm -hmm. He's been at this 10 years now. And the business has gone from 10 million to 50 million mm -hmm. value. Yep, uh, love it. And it's been profitable yes. too. So yep. now is he getting some of that? Yes, like he the is. Profits yeah. getting, the yeah. profit's getting no, distributed. No, no, profits don't get distributed, to be clear. Okay. Uh, yeah, no, no, that's a great question. And, mm -hmm. and, and I'm glad you asked that. I, I, I certainly should address that. So, so no, there are no distributions that go out. There are no dividends that go out. It just, the cash is retained or reinvested in the business. Okay. Right? And so, and maybe you're building cash on the balance sheet. Mm -hmm. Now you should be building some cash to address your repurchase obligations, right? Mm -hmm. as, as people hit retirement age, you mm -hmm. have to buy those back. Well, you got to do it with cash, so so you need mm -hmm. some. Now you can borrow if you don't if you haven't built cash, potentially. Um, but that's all part of the value calculation. When you talk about um, 
equity value, mm -hmm. equity value, whether you're an ESOP or any other company is enterprise value plus cash, less debt, mm -hmm. right? Just like your house. Mm -hmm. Your house is worth 500,000. Mm -hmm. If you've got a $300,000 mortgage, your equity value is 200,000, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. right? In a business, if, you're, if you've got cash and no debt, that cash is just incremental to the value. So right. it doesn't get distributed. You don't, again, you don't get to spend it, mm -hmm. but it's implied as part of your, your share valuation because it's incorporated in the, mm -hmm. in the whole valuation of the business. But for your example, with your, the welder that's been there 10 years, not ready to retire yet, this $90 million offer comes in. Mm -hmm. You know, holy shit, how do we, how do we turn that mm -hmm. down? Okay, they sell the business for $90 million. That 90 million of cash, or however much cash they get, plus whatever earn out there is, gets allocated to the shares. It gets, that cash goes to their account. Mm -hmm. The ESOP doesn't exist anymore. So uh, the smart play here is, of course, you, you don't take it just like any other tax advantage fund, you, you don't take a distribution of that, you roll it to an IRA, okay? okay. So it remains tax deferred, mm -hmm. right? So now his shares, which were, whatever his percentage of, of 50 million was, mm -hmm. well, it's the same percentage now of 90 million. Okay. So it goes to his account, mm -hmm. that deal closes on Friday, mm -hmm. he comes into work on Monday, and he's doing his same job. Yeah. No, nothing's changed, except the ESOP isn't in place anymore. Yeah. And, and, and that happens, uh, Betcher Industries has, has been a great example here in Northeast Ohio, mm -hmm. was in ESOP for a number of years. They sold 80% of the company, mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, call it 10 years ago, I think, to, maybe not even 10 years ago, no, seven or eight years ago, to mm -hmm. um, a local private equity firm. 20% of the, the mm -hmm. ESOP remain. Private equity firm helped really grow the business. And, and when they made that sale, 80% of the value went to their individual accounts and they could leave it in the ESOP account or roll it to, and I, I think they rolled it to an IRA mm -hmm. so they could then invest in outside stocks and whatever they wanted. And then ultimately five years later, that private equity firm sold it to, I think it was to KKR, mm. uh, a big New York private equity fund for a, for a big number. Mm -hmm. And that 20% got their pro rata share. And then on Monday, the employees come in and they're still doing their same jobs mm -hmm. at their same wages and nothing yeah. changes. So then they're, but they're looking at their retirement package. Yeah. And it's better, like it's better by by, by a lot. Forty million dollars. Okay. Yes, their their percentage of forty million dollars. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So, I will tell you, there are some folks in the ESOP community that feel if the company doesn't remain an ESOP into perpetuity, it's somehow a failure. Hmm. I, I don't subscribe to that. I, I I believe you know an ESOP can be a, a great answer for an, hmm. a, a seller, an owner, um, and perhaps twenty years later. Things change, right? And and if he wanted to reward the employees, and twenty years later those employees sell for a huge premium mm -hmm. to somebody else, I don't I don't see that as a bad outcome. Yeah, but they're not getting a check, right? They're that's that's post post retirement. Well, as similar to an IRA or yeah, 401k. We, they get paid the value, and the smart answer is if you're not of retirement age. Mm -hmm. Don't take a distribution, roll that to an IRA mm -hmm. because you're deferring taxes. Okay, but they could take a distribution? They could, and then you, you're subject to- capital gains you, and you're, all that You're stuff. subject to the early withdrawal penalty. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, and, and then current taxes, right? So- yeah. So, because it's unqualified or whatever you want to call that, it's just, it's just money that right. they're receiving. Right, yeah, if you do that. So let's say it's a 55-year-old CFO. Mm-hmm. Uh, and boss man comes in and he's like, hey, no, I'm not doing this ESOP and all blah, blah, yes. blah. And, and they go through that and now he's 62. Um, so he's just, uh, so his work from 55 to 60, 62, yes. same thing. Yep. Yep. It's just less robust. It, it, and that's, that's, that's exactly right. It's, uh, and we certainly have a number of clients where, you know, they, their, their senior management team is, 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 is in their fifties. Right. And mm -hmm. yeah, they, they, they're going to have, five, 10 years of, of earnings under the ESOP versus a, a, a employee that's 30, then they're right. gonna have 25 yeah. years yeah. Okay. or 35 years, right? Um, absolutely, it's gonna be better for, for the 30 year old than it is the 55. Yeah. Um, and you know, I, I, I don't know what to say there. It, it's, it, it is what it is, mm -hmm. it's unfortunate 
time matters. Time, yes. W2 and matters. Yes. All that. Um, obviously the longer you're there and the higher your wages, the, the, the larger your, your, mm -hmm. your benefit is. Yeah. Um, if you're there for it, but it, at the end of the day, what, what I would say is, you know, right place, right time is always, you know, half the battle. Right. But whatever you get under the CSOP scenario, whether you're there as a 55 year old and you retire at 62, mm -hmm. whatever you, you realize over those seven years is more than you would have received otherwise. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's not as much as the, the 30 year old person is mm -hmm. going to get, but it is incremental to your, your retirement. Mm -hmm. and Sure. It's the same with 401k, Absolutely. right? You start a 401k at 55, like, well. Yeah, you don't have a lot of time. Yeah. You know, compounding is, is powerful. It is what it is. It is what it is, right, right. Now, I, I, should, I should also add, um, so in, in, in many cases, I have an owner or a client who, who is just ecstatic about the ESOP and the ability to reward their employees a whole... And, and they say to me, I'm so excited to be able to reward my employees. And, and I, this is this is wonderful. But I've got this management team that's really powerful and they're really driving the business and a lot of value. Is there anything I can do in addition to the ESOP for these senior managers? And the answer is yes. Um, we always institute a SARS plan, S-A-R-S. Mm. I was waiting for another vegetable soup, right? You know, we're, acronym. We're, we are we are filled with acronyms in the in the ESOP world. Sorry, S-A-R-S. All right, stock give it to me. appreciation rights. Okay. So stock appreciation rights or SARS act much like a uh, public company stock option, right? That that you often hear about getting granted to senior executives at public companies, where it has a strike price. And it you know has a vesting period. The 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 typical SARS program in an ESOP is is a five year grant period, and a five year vesting period. So, um, round numbers. Let's say there's a ten percent SARS plan. Now this is non dilutive to the seller. It doesn't reduce the price that they get. But you put in a ten percent SARS plan. The owner gets to decide who participates. The owner or the board, if the owner is not involved going forward. The, and I guess technically it is the board that uh, approves the SARS plan. But um, unlike the ESOP where you have to be non-discriminatory, the SARS plan is reserved for certain key men members of management, mm -hmm. three to five, maybe six or seven perhaps, mm -hmm. um, participants. And the, the, the owner and the board gets to decide who participates in that plan and how much each person gets each year. So if it's if it's this 10-year SARS plan that, I, that I'm, I'm talking about, uh, you have 10% and you're granting it over a five-year period. So you would allocate, assuming that they hit the hurdles mm -hmm. to be granted, um, you grant 2% each year for five years. Okay. And the grant from the first year vests at the end of the fifth year and then is paid in the sixth year. So what they are is they're long-term equity incentives tied to the value of uh, the company mm -hmm. when exercised. So when mm -hmm. you do that first year grant, it's gonna be very low value because you're you know full of debt. So the strike price is a dollar, let's say. Mm -hmm. uh, when you exercise at the end of the fifth year and then you're paid in that sixth year, uh, it's based upon the stock value at that point, less mm -hmm. the dollar strike mm -hmm. price, right? Yeah. The second year grant, Vest at the end of the sixth year, paid in the seventh year. So it's a long-term equity incentive. Mm -hmm. So that's one way. Typically, you know, if you're a 55-year-old CFO, you're probably in that yeah. SARS plan. Okay. Now so the 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 55-year-old welder is probably different. not not participating yeah. right. in the SARS plan. Okay. But it's another way. But it's no loss to them. It's just not as much of a gain right. because of just life cycle, where they are, history, all that right. stuff. Exactly. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. And and one of the other, uh, I think, wonderful aspects of ESOPs can accrue to the, um, you know, the professional services community servicing that company. Hmm. So you think about, you know, attorneys, accountants, insurance brokers, 401k providers or advisors to that company. In a lot of cases, if that company is sold to private equity, 
most of those professionals, or, or strategic buyer, and, and really any third party, most of those service providers typically lose that client relationship. Hmm. The new buyer brings in their own own yeah. team. Yeah, it, yeah. It, it, it just says it is what it is, sure. right? Well, in an ESOP scenario, you don't have this new third party buyer that has their own team that they want. They want you to use this insurance broker and, and this big shiny law firm and and the owner and management team continues to run the business utilizing you know their yeah. trusted trusted folks. advisors yep. so it's a great way for you know that attorney or that law firm the accounting firm the tax professionals to, to not only keep but frankly grow their relationship with that client hmm. and, and and i you know i think we all know it's a lot easier to retain a client than it is to go find a new one yeah sure and, and, and this is a wonderful outcome for, uh, one of the things I really enjoy about being involved in the ESOP community and advising companies like this is, is yes, I, I drive a great outcome for my client, which is the seller, and, and that's, that is my first duty. But I also know that we're creating a tremendous opportunity for the employees now, it depends on the performance of the company, mm -hmm. but, but it's an opportunity, right? Yeah, and sure. as discussed, it can be incredibly lucrative. Yeah. Um, but also, the, the professional advisors to that firm typically keep and then grow their relationship. Mm -hmm. Jobs stay in the community, mm -hmm. right? I mean, how many times have we heard uh, acquisition happens right. and... Off they go, right. You, you know? Uh, yep. And that's, one, interestingly enough, one more... Um, perhaps uh, uh, potential uh, uh, trigger hurdle, not hurdle, um, opportunity is, is a situation where you have small town companies, mm. right? We, I, I can tell you, we had a company in Northern Michigan that was a significant employer in, in their community. They mm. were 10 or 15% of the, the employee, a couple hundred employees. And they, they know they could have sold to a competitor that would have instantly outsourced all the production to uh, India or China, and perhaps mm -hmm. Mexico. But jobs, yeah, of the 300 jobs, 275 right. would, have, would have been gone. And the owner said, I, you know, we're third generation, my family's here, we're gonna be here in the summers, right. I'm gonna go up to the VFW and, right. and have beers with my right. buddy. Right, not get beat up, right, right. in the parking and, lot. And, and, and you know, yeah. now I will tell you, uh, in that case, the, the, I, we got a great transaction for him, I think it was $125 million hmm. sort of valuation, mm -hmm. a really nice number. Could he have sold for what could have been $140 million perhaps mm -hmm. to a premium buyer? Mm -hmm. Yes, but, he also elected 1042 and saved 25 million of, of capital gains taxes. Hmm. Yeah. Right? And he preserved 300 jobs in the community. He was a hero to the employees, mm -hmm. kept jobs in the community. And on a net after tax basis, I'm going to argue he got more than he would have in any other fashion. Hmm. So it was one of these just wonderful outcomes mm -hmm. that was mm -hmm. a win 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 for everybody. Hmm. And, and that's one of the notions that, that makes me crazy is I have a lot of folks that say, well, an ESOP can't pay a, a competitive price. No, an ESOP can pay a fair market value. Mm -hmm. It can't pay a premium, mm -hmm. but how much more do you have to get paid yeah. to realize uh, the, the same net after tax sure. proceeds? You know, 25% sure. capital gains is, is, is a significant number. Mm -hmm. So I, that's what I love about it, right, is, is all these wonderful things that can happen. Mm-hmm. Not just for the seller, but for the for everybody, everybody, all like. the stakeholders, marketplace, the yes. community, the yes. staff, all the stakeholder right. holders. Right now, they still have to go and do their job every day and, and work, and it doesn't mean that suddenly, you know, working at this company is 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 roses and sunshine, you know, every day. It's still a job, and and by the way, people to be clear, people can get fired. Sure, it, it's not a guarantee of employment. By any stretch, well, I'm an owner. You can't fire me. No, no, yeah. that's not how this works. You know. Well, so talk about that. So let's say welder's been there now seven, eight years, and uh, they're forty, well, forty-five, so fifty-two, and he moves on. Yep. Right for whatever reason, he's vested. Yep. So now what? We hear that a, a lot. You know, 
it's not so bad today, but but mm -hmm. Northeast Ohio winters can be pretty crappy sometimes. Mm -hmm. Some people get fed up and say, you know what? I love my job, but I just can't stand the damn cold mm -hmm. and the snow. Right. And I, right. I'm going to Florida. Right. Or or wherever. North Carolina, whatever. North, you, Texas. You yes. Sure. Um, I'd, I'd pick Texas, but whatever. Yeah, very right. good enough. Good enough. I I tend to agree. Yeah. Um, you absolutely. You know, yeah. you, you can leave, and you, as I stated earlier, are always entitled to your vested balance. Mm -hmm. Now, in the plan documents, um, it, it, and it's actually really smart in terms of, of what the law allows. So typically, if you there are two buckets. I like to use my hands. I'm not Italian, but I should be. So there are two buckets in terms of, of, of how payouts, and this is true of a ESOP or 401k. There is a bucket called uh, that encapsulates death, disability, and retirement. Mm -hmm. So you either pass away, mm -hmm. you become permanently disabled and can't work, or you reach retirement age. The law allows the company to pay that benefit out over a five-year period. Okay. And the reason for that is, Th think about if you had uh, 10 highly comped individuals or, or high balanced individuals all retiring at the same year and your document said you had to pay them all, you had to write a check for all, it could be a, a, a potentially a big burden from a cash flow perspective to mm -hmm. the company sure. to, to write sure. 10 big checks. Yeah. So they're allowed to stretch that out over a five year period. Okay. That's one bucket. The other bucket is essentially all other. Mm -hmm. You're 45, you're sick of the winners, mm -hmm. and, and you want to go. You absolutely, excuse me, absolutely are entitled to your vested balance. The company has the right to pay you in five years over five years. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Very smart, because what you don't want to do is create uh, what I would call a perverse incentive to leave. Mm -hmm. Because you and I both know, you know, there's some folks that would, would look at their account balance and say, holy crap, I've got $400,000 in my account. Mm -hmm. I, I never dreamed I'd have that much money. Yeah. I'm out of here. Right. You don't want to create an incentive for people to leave. The whole notion is, is actually to retain people. And I hope we, we have time to talk about mm -hmm. attracting and retaining employees because that's mm -hmm. a big benefit as well. But you don't want to create this incentive for them to leave. I got 400,000, I'm 45, I'm out of here. No, you want to keep that person around, right? So it's their money, but the company has the right to pay it out over sort of a, a 10 year period, if you would. So that reduces the ability, it's their money, but they don't have access to it right away. And so it, it reduces that notion of I've got 400 grand. Now, even if they took it in, 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 in that fifth year and they, they took it all in cash, the smart play is still to roll it to an IRA mm. because again, you're subject to those, those restrictions of if you take it prior to retirement age, mm. uh, you get a 10% penalty yeah. and you know, you're paying the, your, your ordinary income taxes on. So from a tax side, is it treated like a 401k? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's exactly. It's the same. So, and this, this is one of the funny, I always chuckle because I'll talk to folks and, and employees and, and we talk about how it works and all right, when, you know, when you retire, these, these shares are, are bought back and, you know, you're paid, you know, but you have to pay taxes mm -hmm. on those shares when they're redeemed, right? right. Like that is total bullshit. <laughs> Call your representative. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I laugh. I'm like, oh. well, well, how much did you pay for those shares? Yeah, right. You know, the answer yeah, is zero, yeah, right? right. And, and if you think about it, you know, the owner is able to sell and avoid capital gains taxes. Well, I think as we all appreciate, the government always gets theirs in the sure, end, right? Sure. And just like your 401k, your 401k reduces your taxable income, yeah. right? You make your contributions, yeah. it reduces your taxable income. But when ultimately you withdraw those shares from your 401k, yeah. they're taxed. There's a tax event in there several places. Right. For sure. Right. So now in theory, though, when you're, you're, 65 and you're no longer working in theory you're in a lower tax bracket so so it makes yeah. sense to do yeah but so talk about the uh, attract retain employees yeah, no so from a so esop hey we're in esop davy tree all right right here in town mm -hmm. local um and they're saying how would you like to come work for us we're in esop so how is that Right. You, you certainly have to be able to convey the advantages mm -hmm. and, and what it means yeah. to the employees. And yeah. again, it's a long-term benefit. Is Aspland? I know they're a big national I, tree company. I don't know. That's a great question. Hmm. I, I, I don't know. So from a strategically, we're, acquire, we're attracting talent. 
So let's say Asplund isn't. I don't know if they right. are. Or, so or so not, here's, here's the example I use. So if you have you have a candidate that you're pursuing or you're just trying to track in the market broadly, and that candidate has two job offers, one from you mm -hmm. and one from a competitor or mm -hmm. you know, somebody else in, in the market, mm -hmm. pay, benefits, hours, sure. essentially the same between the two. But, but you're an ESOP mm -hmm. and they're not. Mm -hmm. If if I've done a good job in communicating, you know what that means or what it could mean for you. You know, does that employee have to flip a coin, mm -hmm. or if, if if essentially you're the same, it's kind of a no brainer, right? I, I would argue so yes. Manage well, I, I, right? right? I would argue yes. Mm -hmm. and, and you know, Mark, even if it's not managed well, paying benefits are the same. Mm -hmm. And if what's it, the risk? Right. Right. It's worth nothing. Well, yeah. you didn't have an option here. Right. So, again, you have to communicate that to to um, uh, potential hires, yeah. but it, it can be powerful. And I would also say, um, I think what you're going to find is is typically ESOP companies, from a culture perspective, mm. have a much better much mm -hmm. better work environment. It's mm -hmm. it's people are supporting each other. You know, you're all rowing in the same direction. Yeah. Uh, I, I think studies show that, that ESOP companies on the margin mm -hmm. have better uh, uh, cultures, better employment environment, yeah. right? The same yeah. token, by the way, goes for um, existing employees, retention. Mm. Okay. Okay, so we just covered uh, attracting, attracting employees. Sure. Um, there's also the notion of retaining employees. Study after study has shown ESOP employees much less likely to walk across the street for 25 cents or 50 cents more an hour mm -hmm. if they're starting to build and recognize mm -hmm. the balance in their, four, in, yeah. their, in their ESOP, yeah. right? Because mm. uh, it, the first couple of years is tough because you don't have a whole lot of value there, but as you start mm -hmm. to pay that debt down and grow the company, they can see it. They're getting more shares each year. The share value, in theory, is growing. Um, they're building a balance. Now, again, the key is communication, making sure that they're aware and that they know. Mm. Um, there, there are a number of, of uh, I, I know as an example, Principal Financial, that, uh, who we work with a lot, they have, they have a dashboard. Uh, they, will, uh, they handle a lot of 401k plans and they do a lot of ESOP work as well. They have a dashboard that actually has the 401k, like you log in and it'll show the 401k balance and then right underneath it'll show the, the ESOP balance. Mm. So that every time you look, because people can check your 401k balance daily, multiple times a day if you want, right? Right. ESOP value doesn't change yeah. but once a year. But nonetheless, when you log in to check your 401k balance, every time you're going to see that that yeah. uh, ESOP. When you check your 401k, you're going to see your, your ESOP balance. Right, so, right. you know, it's a good way to keep it in front of you. But, but studies have shown employees much less likely to move. And, you know, a lot of times people have to pay up because they've got crappy work environment mm. and they can't keep people. Mm -hmm. So they entice them, instead of improving their yeah. culture and, right, and, right they, sure. they have to pay more. So, yeah. so uh, you know, a lot of people look at it and say, I love working here, 25 cents an hour isn't, isn't worth it. And I'm building this great mm -hmm. balance here. Mm -hmm. That's great. The, the other thing, right, there's always more. I feel like, uh, who who was the detective that that always had just one more Peter Falk? Uh, oh yeah, 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 right. Just just yeah. one more question yeah, yeah. at the end. Um, retention or recruitment rather um, at the senior level. Hmm. So it, it, let's say the owner. The, the, there's nobody. The, they've got great VP of Ops. Colombo. Colombo. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Just one more. I mean, I was working right. that. <laughs> exactly. I was stuck on Princess Bride because he read the Princess Bride book, right, <laughs> in the movie. Right. But, oh uh, my yeah, gosh, Colombo! Colombo. Um, they, they may have some great operations professionals, uh -huh. but nobody that's really. Maybe they need a CFO candidate, or maybe they need a CEO candidate to replace mm -hmm. the, the seller. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you're out recruiting from outside, perhaps, and you've got to put forth a competitive pay and benefits package. But if if you also are an ESOP and you have SARS available and the ability, again, if you're recruiting a CEO, arguably they're going to be the highest paid. So they're gonna earn proportionally the most shares in the ESOP going forward. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that, that can be a really compelling mm. uh, enticement to, mm. in recruiting senior professionals in. Yeah. The SARS can, program. Can the, with the SARS, stock appreciation rights. Yep. Um, uh, what's the R? Uh, rights, what's the S? Stock just right, rights. Just right. 
It's a SAR program. We say okay. you get SARS. Okay. It's, 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 a, it's a little S at the bottom. Okay. Right. Apostrophe S. So mm -hmm. can you hold that back? Can you can mm -hmm. you not allocate all that? Mm -hmm. So you have 10% or whatever set aside. Yep. Well, and, and remember, let's say the first year you don't re hire anybody. Mm -hmm. You've only allocated 2%. You still got another 8% uh, okay. okay. of that 10. So it's for future, future right. hires. Right. It yeah. doesn't mean that if you got 1%, you got a, 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 50 basis points this year that you're going to get 50 points, 50 yeah. basis points next year. It's you may add to the management team, okay. but again, in theory, mm. you, you're hiring people that are going to create value. So, yeah. so you're right. growing the pie. That's right. That's right. Right. Yeah. Interesting. And, Very and cool stuff. You can tweak these things again. None of this is all etched in granite. Mm -hmm. uh, you're, you're trustee. If three years in, they're not being responsive, or you're just not seeing eye to eye, you can replace a trustee. Mm -hmm. Who decides? The the board or, or the, the the seller, the company. Okay. Yeah, okay. it's they're just not it. You know, it's not working. Okay. All right. You you can replace that trustee. Mm -hmm. Now you don't want to do it. You know, every every two years that that mm -hmm. that doesn't feel right. Yeah. But if if there's an issue, yeah, you can swap them out. Yeah. SARS programs can be adjusted. So I I will tell you in um <coughs> in uh, uh the Great Recession or even in in um. Uh, during COVID, you know, companies were clipping along and then suddenly COVID hits and obviously it impacted different companies in different ways, but there were a lot of companies hugely negatively impacted. They didn't have the ability to hit their numbers. Every, everything got reset. You know, you dropped at 20% and, and then, you, you know, you sort of grow again, but you were nowhere near hitting your objectives. The important thing to understand is everybody wants the SARS plan to be meaningful because you're incenting that senior management team to drive value, right? And so if, if there's been this exogenous event, a COVID that, you know, how do you foresee that coming along? Mm -hmm. That's reset your business a bit. Uh, we saw a lot of SARS plans being uh, amended so that people were still motivated, right? It, it doesn't, it, it's intended as a motivational incentive to perform and if suddenly through no fault of your own, th th this mm. uh, COVID comes along and, and, and crushes your business. I saw a lot of trustees uh, and, and boards uh, reset the, 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 the SARS plan and SARS hurdles. Um, exogenous. How about <laughs> right. that, right? What, that's a $5 word. What does that mean? Well, just the... the you know, it's not something the company did or, or they, they, they could have seen coming in their industry, right? Just an, mm. just uh, mm. sort of the, the black swan event. Yeah, that yeah. They had Originating no from outside, right. derived externally. <laughs> All right. It's a little, little uh, vocabulary right, there. On a, on a Friday afternoon. Yeah, jeez. <laughs> after a bourbon and a half. Yeah. Um, side note, a little shout out to uh, Aaron Johnson, EXP Realty. Oh, she cool. provided us with this uh, awesome oh, little fantastic broken to smoking uh, ashtray. I like it. She's great. So if you ever need to buy or sell property, she's wonderful. And you said Aaron, Aaron Johnson, Aaron. EXP you, Aaron. Realty. Um, so my goal was to just try to understand more ESOP. I had a very, very, I would say, elementary understanding of ESOPs. Um, Enough to be able to talk to clients and say, this is an option. Here's something as to consider. As you're looking right. forward. Right. So one of the things I want to ask you about uh, talking to, again to a principal. So they're listening to this going, you know, I should seriously think about that. Right. Um, but not yet. Sure. But, but kind of start laying the groundwork for that. Right. So what's a good, uh, what's a good strategy or what, what should they be thinking about? So let's say my principal, let's say I'm working with a company that's $8 million plumbing company, mm -hmm. uh, and they're, they're not wanting to do a strategic buyer. They love their folks. They love the marketplace. They love, you know, let's say Northeast Ohio. Yep. Um, Want to preserve jobs yep. and reward people. Your Northern yep. Michigan folks, whatever. Yep. Uh, and they know that they're going that way, but it's a number of years sure. out on the horizon. So what are some good kind of... Uh, groundwork that they should start to work toward or lay, uh, lay in place uh, operationally, financially, um, you know, with their own finances. Yep. 
so th this is I would I would argue is, is not even unique to ESOPs, right? But it, it, it is ultimately you want to do as a business owner, as a principal, um, you know, whatever you can to improve the business, the professionalism, um, accounting mm -hmm. systems mm -hmm. is one of the first things I would talk about. Yeah. Uh, many, uh, you know, many companies that I talk to operate on QuickBooks or just mm -hmm. some internal financials. Mm -hmm. Certainly mm -hmm. doesn't hurt to get an accounting firm involved mm -hmm. that can produce mm -hmm. at a minimum sort of compiled. Mm -hmm. So you've got in, in accounting, you've got com compilations, mm -hmm. reviews, and then the highest level mm -hmm. would be an audit. Yeah. Um, you know, most companies don't need an audit, but but certainly mm -hmm. at a minimum, compilations are good. Mm -hmm. uh, reviews are even better. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you, you know, if you do that a couple of years ahead of time, mm -hmm. um, get your ERP systems mm -hmm. up to snuff. And for listeners, ERP is uh, Enterprise Resource Program. What is it? ERP. Um. Uh, I, I don't know. I hear it all the time. Like, oh yeah, the way we get things done. Yeah, right. Yeah, our sure. ERP. Great. Great. That's funny. I got to think about that. Um, <laughs> and, and look, frankly, without blowing too much sunshine up your skirt, <coughs> work with good professionals. Get a yeah. sure. Get a coach in there yeah. to yeah. to get the team aligned yeah. and yeah. <coughs> reporting structures. Fill holes. You know, um, many many folks have uh, a, a solid uh, controller type mm -hmm. person, mm -hmm. you know, it's, a CFO at some point, right. maybe you need to get that CFO, yeah. right? Yeah. A uh, fractional CFO or a, uh, if you're smallish and I would say smallish as in five to 10 million, they can't afford a good, a, a really talented seasoned CFO, CFO that, tr a true CFO. Yep. And a lot of times folks have a quote, true CFO, but they're really, controller with a big C, right. you know, right? Yeah. They're looking backwards. Yep. One of the ways I explain, uh, and this is very practical, very pragmatic, uh, not highly sophisticated for sure, but the way I explain accounting versus budgeting to a future or current client right. is, hey, accounting, it's a big deal. Right. It's, it's, you got to get, right. get it right. That's right. <laughs> but it's thinking about what happened right it look, looking it's backwards a, it's backwards right. yeah it's like hey right. where'd all that money go and that's how i say it where, right. where did all that money go and we ought to account for the money it went where and we write down here's where it went okay and you can look at it and say oh you know what's yeah. changed over previous yep. years but it's yep. not yeah but it's not budgeting which right. is here's this pile of money right what are we going to do with it right how are we going to spend it right uh, how are we going to allocate or, or, or it? Or forecasting even That's just right. the, yeah. the business. Or where do we need in the to invest? future, it's going to come in. Or how are we going to make it come in in the future, right? right? right. And that's, that's really where the CFO shines, right. being able to straddle those two spots and say, okay, strategically, we're headed there. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's what it means financially. But not just financially. In some ways, I think, at least from a business needs standpoint, operational needs standpoint, right. I think it's a misnamed title right. that's not just finances right it's, it's assets a, a, right absolutely yeah no, and it's I, all the things that are assets so whether it's it's staff it's information right it, uh, absolutely. It's, it could be liability right. it could be other other uh competitors you know how are we gonna funnel or manage the resources that are flowing through this business right. and measure them and build them, i call it the pipes and wires sure uh hat yeah. Right where you're you're wearing this hat that says I own the pipes and wires of the resources of this business. Right. Okay, so that means you need to build the pipes and wires, manage the pipes and wires through which these resources flow. You're not creating resources, right? But you are measuring them. You're tracking them, and we need you to tell us like accurately what's going on with those resources, not just finances. Right. Um, and and a lot of times that CFO title moniker get slapped on somebody's relative or somebody that's been there for right. 22 years or whatever. Right. And they may be worthy of some sort of, you know, uh, promotion or something, but that doesn't mean they're really good at strategically thinking about our assets. Absolutely. You and, know? and different size firms will have different needs and, 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 yeah. and levels. But, yeah. but if you truly want to grow, yeah. you, you don't want to hire for where you are today. It's where you want to be. Right. Yeah. And you want to hire good people that help right. get you there. And, and again, I, I, I don't want to underemphasize the, the role that, that, frankly, you can play yeah. in helping those companies, seeing holes and, and, yeah. and, and coaching up. Yeah. And, 
Yeah, my job as a coach is to bring objectivity, right? Get somebody yeah. to go, oh, holy crap, I didn't see it from this right. way. Like, yeah. Because they've run the business the same way for yeah, a long time. Sure. And it's not been bad, it's just yeah. perhaps not as good yeah. as it could be. And you yeah. bring that outside yeah. perspective. Yeah, sure. absolutely. I tell folks, you know, when they, to, to your question, well, what can they do mm. in the next couple of years? It's, 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 it's the blocking and tackling of, of, of running a good business. Yeah. That's right. It's n not anything sexy. You don't have to go hire a, mm -hmm. a, 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 a chief marketing officer to, yeah. to do that. It's, it's just execute better and, yep. and get the right people yep. in, in, yep. in the right seats. Yep. Figure it out, write it down, and go get it. And then measure it. Mm -hmm. Like, did it happen? Yeah, absolutely. And then what are we and, and then adjust. Yep. That's absolutely. Right. Yep. Simple. I mean, it's not easy. <laughs> right. right. But right. it's simple. So... Fascinating combo, buddy. I've been looking forward to this combo for a long time. You and I have been talking about this at some level for, yeah. shoot, a year or so. Yeah, at least. Uh, right. I love it. So yeah. we got to do more of this. I would love to do, I made a note uh, to maybe do a podcast in the future around boards, around, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and I think, you know, this would be a great conversation for you and I as far as what are the pitfalls? How do you build a board? Yeah. How do you go find these folks? I have a number of clients that have, um, that have succeeded or semi succeeded or tried at right. boards of right. some level, whether it's an advisor. And, and I guess I'm thinking advisory board, right. but there's different types of boards. A absolutely. And right. th the first step could be an advisory board. Yeah. Before you get to an, you know, an official board. I mean, at the end of the day, the, Shareholder will still own the shares, yeah. and and he, whether yeah. it's an advisory board or an official yeah. board, I mean, yeah. you know, he can yeah. change out board members, yeah. right? But I think most importantly is, mm. and I, I'm I'll put words in your mouth, but I'm sure you agree that the, the owner has to be willing to accept the recommendations or feedback from the board. Mm -hmm. If you just want yes men, that's not going to do anything for you. Yeah. It's not really going to, it's window they're, dressing. They're not hiring me at that point either, right? Right. right. Be, just because they've got it all figured out, great, I can't help you. So, yeah, I'd love to get together and talk about that. Okay. Uh, just all things boards. Yeah. It's, you know, it's, uh, be fun. they can be very powerful. Yeah. Uh, I, I uh, am a member of uh, uh, PDA. Uh, Private Directors Association. Anybody, another acronym. Well, yeah. PDA. What is that? Private Private Directors, Directors Association. Association. Okay. Yeah, there's a the Cleveland chapter okay. um, that I'm a member of that that uh, is focused e exactly on this this issue of how do you create uh, strong boards, effective boards, um, because it is it is important. Yeah, it is. Very cool, buddy. Thanks for a uh, fun combo. I loved it. I appreciate you having me down, and I and, uh, always enjoy spending time with you. Well, we got some out, uh, extra output music, right. whatever, um, coming on here. But you, you, uh, By the way, you, you do a great job with it. These are really, they're entertaining, they're, they're thoughtful. Thanks. Informative. Thanks. I work hard at it. It's, 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 a, it's kind of a labor of love. Um, I think it's, I mean, I'm aiming this at my clients. Sure. Aiming it at future clients, and aiming it at maybe other people's clients who... Uh, as far as advisors, uh, aiming it at advisors too, uh, right. or key leadership uh, members, uh, well, CFOs, et cetera, et cetera. I, I've got to do a better job of, of, of keeping you in my, I, you know, as I said, usually I'm, I'm focused on the transactional aspects, but with Jeff on board now and, and just the notion of, of, mm -hmm. of, of, you know, moving forward, I think you can play a, a, a big role with a number of my clients. So. Good talking with you, Sean. Mark, thanks for having Appreciate me. Appreciate it, buddy. Yeah. Happy Business happy. broken to smoking. Happy Friday. This is the best way to end a week. Not just to sit here with somebody like you smoking <laughs> and sipping on something good. Am I going to see you this summer at uh, yeah. Beef Bourbon Bocce? Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. That was fun. I want to get Seth uh, Brisket. It's yes. Brisket, right? Seth. I want to get him in here. Uh, there's a number of other key advisors yeah. that that are just wicked smart yep. and funny and interesting yes. and uh, would love to. And, and good dudes, right? Yeah, at the end sure. of the day. Yeah. That's yeah. all I want to work That's with. That's right. That's right. It's all about that. All right, buddy. Good, good combo. Thank you. Yep.